People are the worst, aren't they? I've, I, I've never had road rage as bad as I have since I've turned like 30. I get, I honestly, pe- pe- people on the road, like, why do they exist? Why are other people on the road? Why do I mean, you get for like this? me? <laughs> and to, to get from A to B? Uh, they just stay at home, mate. It's so much easier. Mate, it's not like when I go swimming in the morning and you get pulled. Everything rage. gets delivered to you now. There's literally no reason to leave the house. <laughs> Earthquake Davies, is it connecting? So, of course, Jose is going to be bloody last again, as always. Classic Jose. Classic Yay. Jose. What hey, up, dog? Hello. Uh, how is your uh, little rock hotel experience, Ben? Ba-ba-da. Oh, that's cool. Oh, it does look nice. Do I think I'm going to really struggle with this episode because I can't, like half the shows that I've said are cancelled, I can't remember any of them. I mean, is like, it, it's oh. a good... I suppose that's one document. of the reasons why they were cancelled. We played in Graceland yesterday. We did a show at Graceland and uh, we got a private tour of Elvis's fucking mm. like, house and stuff. And we, we, they, she funded, like, the, the tour guide funded us down this corridor. Um, there's a place called the Jungle Room, which is like, like, all, like plants everywhere and there's a waterfall and stuff. And we go down this little corridor and at the end she's like, just go down that corridor and take a right at the end and go through the door. And the guys all fucking like went down there, door was locked. And she was like, and we were like, oh, uh, door's locked. And she had to like get past the door. And as she was walking past us, she was like, oh, I see, I've got you caught in a trap. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Elvis Presley puns. This is fucking like amazing. <laughs> all right, guys, I apologize for my sexy voice. I'm feeling under the weather today. I was going to say, you do sound really sexy. <laughs> I thought when you turned up. You've gone, you, if you've gone full Phoebe. From, yeah, uh, I was. Yeah. I was uh, Sing Smelly yeah. Cat. <laughs> no, smelly cat, smelly cat. Hi and welcome to a very special episode of the We Need a Rose podcast. I'm your host, Annoyed Neil, and I've assembled my adventuring co-hosts today as we rant, shout, and generally get very angry as we give you our top 10 cancelled shows of all time. I'm joined by the disputatious David. Hey, all Howdy, all The belligerent Ben. <laughs> I don't know what David just did, but hi. <laughs> just plain mad Marie. <laughs> and the jaded show. Jose. And yes, I realise it doesn't rhyme after I wrote it, but it had two J's in it. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, why, was... did you, why did you say that like you're answering a phone to a number you didn't recognise? <laughs> Hello. Uh, the, the jaded Jose thing was like, uh, okay. oh, it was a bit. It was a bit, Ben. A bad bit. See, the uh, both start with B. There we go. Oh no, I got that. Yeah. Anyway. Because there is nothing more piscomely annoying than discovering a great show in which you get fully invested with the world and the characters and then some corporate dickweed using metrics the general public are not privy to decides to cancel it because it either costs too much money or, heaven forbid, a show gets better after its first season and becomes a great show. Parks and Rec. Look, basically, oh, yeah. it's all Lost's fault because since Lost, we live in a world where unless your show is a smash it out of the gate, there is very little chance it gets a second season. But with the advent of streaming and every company in the world looking for IPs and content, yes, I feel dirty saying both those words, we briefly had a golden geek age where all our favourite books, games and comics were adapted into, you know, some pretty decent or great good TV shows and movies. And of course, then they all got cancelled. So we are basically back where we started 20 years ago, where if you aren't a success straight away, then you're basically done for. And with the impossible to know metrics of streaming, even being a number one show worldwide for a month is no guarantee of a second season. So actually, we're in a worse place because streaming companies don't actually have to give us a reason, unlike in the network days where they can only fall back and blame the viewing figures. And breathe, Neil. So, <laughs> everyone, I'm, to I'm going to ask you this question. Why do you think shows have been cancelled? Marie, why do shows get cancelled? I mean, I think, I, I mean, there's no, I think, logic to some of this, but I think there's a few reasons. Number one, I do think there is a marketing issue, um, which I've seen with a few shows, like, and a couple of ones that are actually been on our, and are on our list, where the marketing has just, like, been non-existent, and in today's, there is just so much shit out there, like, you have to be able to market your show, and you have to be, and it's not just long-form 
it's short form form you have to have like a trailer on tiktok or instagram it's it's now short form as well so i think marketing and then a um second and not i mean this is not and my second reason and i think the majority of my personal list for that is it's just too gay like a lot of stuff <laughs> on my list is shows with <laughs> queer characters in it and lo and behold they always get cancelled after season one and i'm not one for conspiracy theories but i do see a pattern here like <laughs> it's actually my personal number one pick like i want that show back so badly and we will find it out in a little while and david why does stuff get canned people just stop watching now i think it's probably <laughs> or it's too expensive to make in the first place it's all good like it's everyone everyone's here it's all going to be the pretty similar thing and it's all going to be connected and it, like marie's thing where the marketing issues come into viewership uh they'll create a really expensive show or perhaps they want to promote another expensive show like on netflix so they want to do let's say avatar the last airbender that's going to cost a hell of a lot more than doing this show over here but we're going to get more viewers for this show potentially than getting redoing this show and not getting that many at all. So I'm going to pump money into this show and we'll have to make budget cuts somewhere. That show's got to go, even if it, even if it was popular. Because, uh, you know, imagining Avatar will be, it's a bigger IP, get up more money, more viewership. That's my idea. People will stop watching, essentially. People stop watching. <laughs> ben, why? Why? <clears throat> why? I think, uh, obviously... The points that have just been made are very, very, like, very true. But I also think there's an element of, um, uh, it happens in the music industry quite a lot where you get something quite similar that you've been working. And let's say, like, Project A is something that a studio has been working on for years and years, and or, you know, for ages. They've pumped a load of money into it that they want to get back. Then someone comes along and comes up with Project B, which is very similar, but a better concept. So a studio will buy it contractually they're obligated to make that first season and then they shelve it so it doesn't compete with their other property. I think that is something that I cannot prove. I know it definitely happens in the music industry and I'm wondering how much it happens in TV. It's either that or aliens. <laughs> nice. I was about to say, ooh, a very logical argument. And then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know aliens me? is very logical. very logical. I like to undo my hard work by being a complete fucking idiot. <laughs> And that brings us to no, that's such a bad segue. I was gonna say that brings us oh, to Jose. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean, my friend. I did not mean. But, I mean, I would have taken it. Okay. <laughs> so uh first first of all, I'd like to shout out for the YouTube viewers how sexy Ben is posing right now. Look at that. He's all comfortable. Look at that. <laughs> you guys are all at work. I'm just having fun. There we go. Um <clears throat> so I, I think everyone has made a good point about budget and viewership in which I think Netflix and a lot of streaming, when they dump a show out, we get a ton of viewers right away, but then it slowly tapers off. So metrically, there's no reason to hold on, even though in the beginning it, it, it did really well. But something that I learned when I did research on more of the old style cable shows, um, and it's something that we, we probably would have never thought of, or I didn't think of at all, was uh, executives. Um, Dickweed. Apparently, executives and even heads of studios can change regularly. And a lot of times what these guys do is they're like, well, this was something the other executive or the other head of the shows put in. It's not mine. I don't care if it's doing well. I'm going to get rid of it and have my own legacy. And I've, a lot of times shows will be canceled because of that. And it's something that we can't we can't do anything about because someone's ego is getting in the way. Corporate malfeasance, cocaine, and dickweeds. Yeah, so I, I was really shocked, but it makes a lot of sense that it, it, in Hollywood, that's kind of what can control a show's livelihood, you know, unless it's like a smash hit. A lot of the shows that we liked, first seasons, especially Fox, they, they never hold, hold on to shows very long. And so, like, yes, we see the promise, but unfortunately, a majority of the audiences never did. And so for the shows that we enjoyed they were cult followings because there just wasn't enough ratings and so these shows on paper did deserve to die it was just sad that they were never allowed to grow to your point really quickly the um one of my favorite shows of all time as a kid was a show called red dwarf and Ugh. red red dwarf 
season one was supposed to get cancelled, but the guy in like, the head of BBC comedy got fired. And as a fuck you to the next guy coming in, commissioned season two of Red Dwarf as one of the last things he did. So it actually works in reverse as well as like negatively. So Red Dwarf then ran and became successful off the back of this guy's fuck you, I've been fired. I'm going to throw a bunch of budget <laughs> contractually at this show that's failing. That's awesome. That's- We'd have I never got we- Rimmerworld. <laughs> Yay. Honestly, that, I think I posted that a little while ago. I was like, it, it's not sacrosanct, but this would be one of the few shows or books that I'd love to see a big budget remake of Red Dwarf like it with a proper budget like a Disney level budget behind it imagine what they could do because you go back to the original books and they are so amazing and BBC Mm. it just didn't have the scope to do it sadly it never has even when it went to Dave I mean yeah Dave didn't have the budget either but it was still good it was still good in places Uh, yeah I agree with basically everything you've all said the only thing I would add on to that as well is there's just so many shows now and like you say and a brilliant show can get lost. I mean, it's a running joke that, oh, this is brilliant. You know, no one watches anything on Apple because it's on Apple because no one's got Apple. And yet they, Apple don't even seem to care that no one's got Apple because they're a electronics company and not really a TV studio. And which, <laughs> So they, you know, it's kind of this weird thing where they're not actually that fussed about it and rarely cancel anything. Although they did cancel Time Bandits, you fuckheads. Which I really Are enjoyed. you serious? Already? Yeah. Already. Already. It's the most recently cancelled show we're going to be talking about on here. Son man. of a bitch. So we are now going to move on to explaining the ranking system. So we each submitted our own top 10 lists with number one getting 10 points down to number 10 getting one point. These totals are then added together using the power of maths to give us our overall list. And and in cases where shows have the same amount of points, in other words, a tie, we're going to mention all of the shows uh, because the point of the episode is to shine a light on so many great shows that were snuffed out before their time. So get your snacks, get ready to hopefully discover some great shows you never heard of, and then get furiously angry that they've been cancelled. Now, obviously, there are metric shit tons of shows we could mention this episode, and this episode's definitely going to go long enough anyway. And somehow, I we had a post on our Twitter go semi-viral a few weeks back. Now, usually I put out a post asking for comments on the episode we're going to be talking about. We say, yeah, we'll read those comments for a shout out on the episode. What I didn't realise when I jumped on the Netflix cancels trend hashtag the other day was the massive amount of replies we were going to get. And at this point, the post was viewed over six and a half thousand times and we had over 90 comments. Uh, Clearly too many to read out. Yes, like I promised. So I've hit upon this solution. We're going to read out any comments that didn't make our list. So if you mention a show that we're going to talk about later, we're not going to read out your comment because you've mentioned the show. We're going to talk about it. But first, I do have to address there were four shows that we got more comments about than anything else. And the first one is Dead Boy Detectives. We had so many pissed off Dead Boy Detectives fans commenting. And I think one of the most piss ridden factors for them was the lateness of the cancellation because season two had already been written and was just ready to go. First comment I'm going to read out here is from Cam at 42 miles per hour. And they said, this show had a dedicated fandom, spent three weeks in Netflix's top 10 category, and the second season was already written before it got cancelled. I've watched a lot of shows that have have gotten cancelled, but this cancellation is the most baffling by far. So, guys, did any of you watch Dead Boy Detectives? I watched the, like, first few episodes, and then, unfortunately, I got kicked off of my mom's Netflix because they (laughs) caught on to the password sharing. (laughs) (laughs) If you hadn't, though, would you have continued? I would have continued. I mean, because it's the same universe as the Sandman and I really like the Sandman series and that boy detectives is like right in my alley. Once again, I want to point out it's a queer show that got canceled. So uh, after one season, so it also falls in that category. But I also thought it was good. The production value was good. The casting was great. Um, It uh, reminded me of another show that's on our list that got canceled after one season, which always made me a little bit worried. But yeah, I understand why the fan base is furious. Before you carry on, I just mm-hmm. want to say, in your uh, like, in your beautifully written notes here, you said that it spent three weeks in Netflix top 10. I've yeah. always been wildly fucking suspicious of Netflix's own rated top 10 to, like, thing. Yeah. Like, it's like Netflix says it's in Netflix's top 10 of a poll we did in the fucking office. Like, I don't think that that's a very good met like system of like, like you see, you see stuff that comes out there. Like, um, I, I think it was like one of the one of the fucking um Batman movies, one of the like uh, maybe the Snyder Batman v Superman, and it was nowhere in the top ten. It had just been dropped, and I was like, people are fucking watching that. Like, I know all my friends that have just like gone and watched it, and it's like, there's, I was like, I, okay, so maybe I've I haven't got that many friends, 
But I don't believe <laughs> that Netflix that Netflix is like when I see something in Netflix is top ten, I'm just like, fuck you, that's a lie. Yeah. Don't buy it whatsoever. All it, I, I think, especially with Netflix, it's this is our new thing, so therefore everyone's watched it, even mm-hmm. if they haven't, because we're gonna make you watch it. And whatever goes on the homepage is what they've been paid the most to put on there. And there's a couple of things in the, in our list that I've seen that are, were, were number one in that top ten, and I think it's just a way for them to like, like move it. units. Yeah, they're like yeah. it's not actually a top ten. Yeah. It's just how it's just that's advertising for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Compared even if that's, it, if it I give that you, is I give true, you, Tiger King. Tiger King. I watched. Tiger, I think everyone watched Tiger King during everyone COVID. It was COVID. COVID. It was there COVID. Was nothing else to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and for the record, Ben, we we are your friends. Just yeah. like that. <laughs> So packed to Dead Boy Detectives. Yeah, I watched the first two, I think. And yeah, I saw the, like the link to Sandman. I was like, oh, oh yeah, this is really cool. I'm, I'm going to keep watching this. And then I just didn't. And I think the reason I stopped watching it was because I was still so annoyed at Lockwood & Co. getting cancelled, which in <laughs> genre was so similar a show to Dead Boy Detectives. And I just didn't want to invest my time watching another show. But I was like, this is so going to get cancelled. You know, like you say, it's a queer show and it's young adult fantasy. And they just commissioned them and then cancelled them. So I was waiting for the season two announcement. I was like, okay, if it gets a second series, I'm going to go back and watch it. And I know why they, I, I know my guess at why they commissioned this when they had Blockwood and Co. there and cancelled that is because uh, Devil Detectives is a Neil Gaiman one. And obviously they're working with him on Sandman season two. So, you know, Jonathan Stroud, who wrote Lockwood and Co., they're not doing anything else with him. So it's kind of, oh yeah, keep keep the uh, the, 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 the author happy in, in a way. If we, we'll do it's this probably, property of yours. It's probably a contractual obligation. They yeah. bought. They wanted. They wanted Gaiman's like like catalog, but they wanted Sandman and and his like agent probably went. Well, you if you take Sandman, you've got to buy. You've got options on all these other ones. And to keep Sandman, they probably had to make a series of one of his other one of the options. That's how. That's why Sony have to keep making Spider Man movies because if they don't yeah. make a Spider Man movie every the two years, the rights revert, Mark, don't they? Mark, yeah. So maybe it's a contractual thing as well. So thanks mm. contracts. At Mistress Char, uh, hashtag Dead, Dead Boy Detectives has got to be one. My Dead Boy Detective post on the at Netflix cancels uh, hashtag has 97,000 views, hundreds of likes and shares. People underneath comment and say they couldn't believe it was cancelled and others going, quote, this show looks great. Why didn't they promote it? Question mark. Uh, going into what Marie said. There you go. Smashing like, what she was saying about promotion and marketing and stuff. Captain Space Shorts at Melly Film said, Gonna have to say Dead Boy Detectives. No promotion, algorithm weighed against it. Spooky show, premiered in April. Yeah, still managed three weeks on Netflix's top 10. Two weeks on Nielsen. I didn't know that was on Nielsen now. Uh, 92 rotten... 92% Rotten Tomatoes, 30, 30 plus best off list. Season two is written, engaged, and in growing fandom. Egregious. And they get bonus points because I literally put that in my post. Watch favourite shows of yours has been egregiously cancelled. So they get bonus points for mentioning egregious back in it to me. So, great job. I was just going to say, that's another good point. Nearly everything on our list also has like a high Rotten Tomatoes score. It's like they were like loved everywhere. So This, of course, leads me on to the next most mentioned show, which was Lockwood & Co., which was so bloody good and left us on an incredible cliffhanger of Lockwood about to reveal to Lucy and George what was in the locked room. Well, we're not going to ruin that here for you, but go and check out Jonathan Stroud's books to find out and you won't be disappointed. And honestly, still to this day... Our two episodes where we talked about Lockwood and Co. and then the one we talked about getting cancelled are our most listened to episodes of any. It's insane. The fandom for that show is crazy. Jose, what did I have to people have to say about it? At Fluffy Pinkett's Lockwood and Co. It's always going to be Lockwood and Co. for me. The skull has my heart. Exclamation point. Exclamation (laughs) point. Exclamation point. The skull has my heart. It's. (laughs) Like, I was trying to on. do it sexy. Come on, I know, but come on with the with the, <laughs> with the exclamation I points they add on there. I thought that was great. All yeah. of a sudden, yeah. has my heart. It was a, for a second there. It was a book on tape. At Spice T twenty three said, you, "You know, we're never going to forgive or forget Netflix UK for cancelling Lockwood and Co because Complete Fiction, they had a production company who made the show, did an amazing job. We're so glad they did ClusterCon twenty twenty three and Lock Nation Me with us, so we could tell them we're still fighting to save Lockwood and Co. So yeah, Lockwood and Co fans actually organised an online con called ClusterCon wow. last year." Wow. For free, and the fans were able to interact with each other. And also, they had guests like the author of the book, Jonathan Stroud. They had the DOP of the show, Oliver Curtis, uh, Bradley Down, a script editor on the show, the right one of the writers, Joy Wilkinson, and the director, William McGregor, as well as the whole exec producer of the whole shebang uh, from the production company Complete Fiction and Racial Prior. Now, what I like about this is sometimes I think in the industry, when a show's cancelled and everything's so fast moving, you think the creatives behind it would just 
right, it's been cancelled, boom, we're on to the next thing. The fact that they're still obviously loved working in the show that much, that they're taking the time, like a year after it's been cancelled, to still go out and do like a fan convention for that. For, yeah, and, you know, the, sadly, the show isn't coming back. It's almost two years now, and all the actors are working on other stuff. You just know that's, you know, that's usually the thing when the show's not going to happen. But it's just such a good example of like a positive fandom there. Like, and again, the amount of comments we've had from people about Lockwood and Co over the years is just, it's crazy now, man. I'm pretty sure I checked out your podcast because of the Lockwood and Co episode. I think that was like the first one I heard from you guys. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Were you on it, Jose? Yeah. I don't think I watched the show, but I was part of the crew. And now you're banished again. <laughs> I was part of the, uh, the group at that form. point. You were the Truth reason it got cancelled, Jose. Next up, Warrior Nun. A European production that was likened to a modern-day version of Buffy in some places. Now, I admit, I watched a few of them and it never really hooked me as much. But it was cancelled after its second series. And then it, there was a massive fan campaign that got underway. And uh, Paul Tassi of Forbes wrote... Netflix cancels Warrior Nun, and you're going to like this, Ben. It's highest audience scored series ever for reasons. And um, it was apparently the highest single rated show of a season in Netflix history, according to Rotten Tomatoes at the time. Wow. And, of course, it was cancelled. At Bella Snow 30, always and forever Warrior Nun. It's not just a loss. It's a whole black hole in our hearts. Oh, you I mean, felt that. That cut deep. Back. I did. I, I kind of agree because I loved that show. I thought it was really good. And and like and it it drew me in. It was one of those ones where like it was like action enough, it was like kind of like fun and sexy enough to just like turn my brain off and just enjoy the ride. It didn't have to like move me or like, you know, reshape my the way I think about things. It was just fun. And it was and it was a really great concept. I like being a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. Like this kind of spoke to me as well. So like I do, I genuinely do feel um uh I'm with you at Bella Snow 30. At Monty Dom 32. Canceling Warrior Nun was unforgivable and Santa Clarita Diet cancelled on a literal cliffhanger. This makes me want to watch Santa Clarita Diet, but you sad it's to hear good. about Warrior Nun. I, I, I believe Santa that Clarita showed... was number wait, am I allowed to say? Am I allowed I mean, to say? No. Oh it was number oh. one. It was number one for me. I was so sad that show got cancelled. Spoilers, spoilers. Fucking the, the cliffhanger it ended on. The cliffhanger right, it ended take on. It, take it, take it, take a breath. Bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. <laughs> think think of uh, Game of Mr. Thrones. Ball It'll Lakes, distract guys. you. No, don't think you think you're thinking Game of Thrones. I'll just set him off again. <laughs> you know, I'm not thinking about Game of Thrones again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We need to rename uh, Jose to Timmy Triggers right now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, for, in terms of Warrior Nun, for once, it actually looked like the fan pressure had paid off because the show's creator, Simon Barry, stated in June 2023 that the series had been revived, crediting the fan support in, in helping make it happen. However, Netflix wasn't involved in this revival. He, the guy then posted the link to the website, warriornunsafe.com, showing a countdown to August 15th, 2023. The exec producer, Dean English, then confirmed in August that the storyline would continue with the series in a trilogy of feature films and also teased the universe based on the series. However, that was over a year ago and nothing has happened yet. So any Warrior Done fans, just let us know what is going on with this revival because it seems like it's stuck in a development hell, much like our community film that we're still waiting for. Hey. Apparently it's under development. <sighs> it's always under development. It's always under development. It's never going to... Six movie. seasons in a movie. Yes. Six seasons now, in a movie. The other show that got lots and lots of attention, and Marie, you're going to like this one, was Shadow and Bone, which once again had superb metrics. But interestingly, this time, Netflix blamed the actors and writers' strike. Not didn't blame, They didn't blame the actors. They blamed the writers and actors' strikes and uh, as a reason for cancelling the show. And the fans were even more pissed off because they'd already announced a Six of Crows spin-off show, mm -hmm. and that was all written, ready to go, and they cancelled both of them. I really liked Shadow and Bone. I did not read the books. They kind of came out after I was no longer a young adult, uh, basically. <laughs> like, I, I think uh, they weren't... Like, they came out after, like, I was a teenager, the Grisha Versh books. But I really do like the show because I, I watched anything fantasy-related. And also, like, fun fact for season one... They shot the majority of it in Hungary, and I actually like do know like I've been to the majority of the locations in per uh, uh, like multiple times. Especially the little palace is in Seget, and 
uh, this was like they released season one during COVID and haven't been back like to Hungary because of COVID for like three years at this point. So like seeing Hungary was really cool. I was just like the Leo meme. I was like, oh, I've been there. But it was solid young adult fantasy. And the and of course, I think what a lot of people would say about the show, the most interesting part of the series was the crows. So I was really excited about the fact that they got their own spinoff. And yeah, the fact that that got canceled was annoying. I have to say, like when like the crows were the ones that kept me in sp spot every time it went to the other characters, I was like, eh, meh. But like the crows are amazing and yeah, I thought the world was cool. I thought there was a cons like it did lean very into young adult tropes, but it definitely deserved to like tell its full story. I mm. have a question: Is the crows a someone's a character's last name, or is it literally crows? No, because no. I'm imagining like crows just lined up on like a <laughs> yeah. Telephone. I was wondering. Okay, it's a gang. It's a gang. So the book is actually okay. called The Six of Crows, and it's a thieving gang that like runs around this fictional uh, verse and like performs heists. Uh, I was imagining just a bunch of birds. Mm -hmm. but, okay. I, mean, no. I was thinking like, people who turn into birds. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, m moving on, moving on. So uh, Claudia Dunaj says, The Six of Crows spin-off cancellation was such a shock. The scripts were already written. The cast loved it. It had the most it has the most amazing heist, the biggest mistake Netflix has ever made. At Kit's White Shirts, uh, Dead Boy Detectives, slash, I am not okay with this, slash, end of the fucking world, slash, first kill. Which sounds like escalating threats, really, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It sounds like they're really annoyed about Dead Boy Detectives being being cancelled. She's not. They're not okay with this. It's the end of the world, and they're going to kill, kill someone. someone. <laughs> but, that, but that is just a list of, uh, of shows that got cancelled, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Uh, There's no good. few through narrative. The next person is Cage Fighting Pod. I'll never not be angry about Last Man on Earth being canned, especially with it ending on a cliffhanger. I actually saw a couple episodes. That was really, really funny show. Good old Will Forte. Great show. Great show, man. The episode where he's driving, a, he, he finds an abandoned air, like a uh, military aircraft, and he's just driving it through the streets. It nearly killed me laughing. Uh, at Metallica Wolf, great name because it's Matt and then. Alica, so Metallica at Metallica Wolf, double T. American yeah, we get words, they'll carry on. <laughs> Do you? Do you? American Cod was cancelled way too early, as I'm sure uh, Mr. Ricky Whittle will agree. And Utopia UK for me was the biggest TV, TV cancellation of all time. That was a 10 out of 10 show. Let me just psych myself up for this one. Okay. <clears throat> at uh, RP Canary PI says. No, it's at Canary Private Detective because that's okay. the show I want to watch. Oh, shit, there was more. Oh, so I thought nice. it was just The Midnight Club. I didn't realise there was a little bit underneath that. Okay, they said, I thought The Midnight Club was pretty decent. I believe it was cancelled on a cliffhanger after one season. David, can you confirm? I think that was for you, Neil, that section that, at the end. David, I can you confirm? Oh. was you, because I, I know you watched it. I don't know. I, I was like... the reason why it got cancelled again, because I stopped watching it. <laughs> after about... but it was by uh, your bro. Your, it was by your bro, your man. I know. Bro. Don't let him know, though. Mike don't... Flanagan. It I mean, was I a hope Flanagan he show. to this, because I... I I really want to work for him one day, so maybe cut that out because you know Mike's going to listen. Mm. Yeah. So oh. don't, don't I don't want him to know that about me. We are getting a lot positively. of famous listeners. We are. It's true. Well, I I got retweeted by the director of the Substance uh, the other week because I said oh. that last twenty minutes is one of the most insane experiences I've ever had in the cinema, and just the look on people's faces. But this isn't the one about the Substance. But we'll get back to that sometime. Jose, next at Saturn Widow, maybe Julian the Phantoms. Kristen Pratt at Pratt underscore Kristen. I really loved hashtag the brother's son, something I've never actually watched uh, and was disappointed they cancel it. And Michelle Yeoh was fabulous as always. Justin Shen, was that Shen? And Sam Lee were fantastic. Uh, I want to see them in more things. Great action scenes, a lot of hearts, fun soundtrack. We love a soundtrack here uh, oh, soundtrack. on We Needed Roads. So Is this the one where there's a guy in high school and he starts to learn he has magical kung fu powers? I don't know. I haven't watched it. I don't oh. think any of us have watched mm. it. So that's on the list. No, I haven't I seen it. We'll have to watch it. Uh, Ellie, at, at Ellie actually gives us, um, she gave us a massive list of shows. And so we have cut some of the ones that we're going to talk about later. But even from that, there were still about four or five shows here that I hadn't heard of. So Anne with an E, not a clue. Everything Sucks. No, no. Everyone's looking. No. That uh, sucks. Right. No, Pretty I mean, Smart. So then um, there was also The Irregulars, which... Steampunk Victorian fantasy show. You know that's getting cancelled after one season. 
<laughs> Bastards. <laughs> that was really good. I completely oh, forgot no, about that. I haven't seen Everything well. Sucks. Uh, I've never okay. even heard of it. I'm mixing it up. <laughs> it's a really great descendant song. That's why. Oh, of course it is. And Dead to Me as well, which I, I think was the uh, Linda Carter. Dead to Me. That's one? on my list. At Next to the Isle, Mindhunter slash OG Quantum Leap. Uh, never understand this one getting cancelled and Quantum Leap the first time. But OG Quantum Leap. Yes, it was cancelled, and yes, it was heartbreaking, but it gave us the very best ending to any series ever, in my opinion. Like, the way that show ended, the way they drew that together, and like, and how Sam Beckett like, like has to make a decision that he can go back and fix oh. something that he... That he went, oh, it was spoilers. <laughs> spoilers for a show from the I feel like oh, that's no. like a whole other podcast as well. Are you gonna Best are you gonna go back and watch something from the nineties, Jose? Like are you honestly gonna go back and watch Quantum Leap? <laughs> oh, I mean, seven is, seasons what? of twenty two episodes. Yeah. And it was yeah, it was cancelled. It was cancelled after seven seasons, like yeah, like like Neil I, just I mean, said. How, like, how was it cancelled It wasn't really then, seven I, seasons? Because there was no ending. Did, it didn't end yes, Jose. Was. For me, and that end of Quantum Leap was as good as the end of uh, like Sopranos, where you just get that kind of like, oh Ooh. shit, what's about to go down? Like that was fucking genius in my opinion. And Quantum Leap had the same ending. So, was it a VO? Was it a VO at the end, nah. or was it a like a bit of text that come up on the screen? Like when you used to finish, it was, te- old... it was text on the screen. It was text, and yeah. I was like, ah, oh. it's like you know when you used to complete an old Spectrum forty eight K game or something, and you like completed the game. He goes, congratulations, you have won, and it was like this. <laughs> and it said something on screen, and it was really disturbing. You're like, what? what? But yeah, uh, possibly. <laughs> My voice went really high there. Uh, at launching the pilot, said Travelers. Anyone heard of a show called Travelers? Yeah. No. What is Travelers, Ben? Uh, I've got it in a nutshell. I think it's. Um, I think I think it's time travelers. People come go back in time, but they inhabit people's bodies so they send their consciousness back in time they inhabit people's bodies from like now and they have uh, i gotta be careful with spoilers again but um they they inhabit people's bodies and use those people to enact some sort of plan that they have to either oh. save the future or or like have something happen in the future like oh. it's it's pretty good like it's pretty good like it's it was one of the good. actors from will and grace Yes, it was one of the guys, the guy from Will and Grace. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, he seemed very evil in that show. <laughs> I saw the first episode. It, they all, Spoilers, they all come across as really evil. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you Jose. bastards, turning it around on me. You reap what you sow, my friend. <laughs> and you're going to get sowed all over. Uh, oh, uh-uh. you're going to get sowed right up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I choose not to. <laughs> Our friends over at the Doom Generation Pod said Manhunter when they meant Mindhunter. But then they explained it by saying it is 2.30 a.m. when they responded to that tweet. And also, there is a film from the 70s called Manhunter that I guarantee you just look up because it's, 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 it just looks mental and crazy and really bad. And now I want to see it. So Manhunter from 1974. So before we get to our, uh, our honourable mentions, I'm going to run through this as quickly as humanly possible, but hopefully enough, slow enough don't, that you can don't actually forget understand breathe. it. Breathing so is good. in this yeah. section... No interruptions. You can jump in at, at the end because there was a lot of shows here that we're not going to talk about in any more depth than me literally reading out the name of them just to go, oh, yeah, that was a show. <laughs> and Freaks and Geeks, Seth Rogen, Linda Carnelli, and many more, a teen comedy drama from Paul Feig. One season. The Get Down from Baz Luhrmann, starring Justice Smith, about the birth of hip hop. Half a season because they never Netflix never did the second half of the show. Ourselves. Pushing Davis, Brian Fuller's whimsical comedy drama with Anna Friel and Lee Pace. Brilliant show. My Lady Jane. I mean, it was just cancelled and we talked about it a lot. Hashtag save my lady Jane. Brimstone. Smallville's John Glover as a devil from 1998 about a cop who gets killed on duty, makes a deal with a devil to recover escaped souls from hell. Cancelled. Constantine. Matt Ryan from took on the TV man to Constantine for one season in a pretty great show, but it was Fox and then it got cancelled and then he got folded into DC's Legends of Tomorrow, yeah. which was fine. My so-called life, the original teen drama that launched Claire Danes and Javaletto, one season. Battlestar Galactica, the original Battlestar Galactica, it had an $8 million pilot in 1978 and had 24 episodes, and then it was cancelled. But I think the, probably the first big fan campaign to bring a show back was Star Trek. This was probably one of the next big ones. And it was saved, and it was brought back. Although it probably shouldn't have been, because it turned into Galactica 80, where they were on Earth, and it was basically just chips. It was fucking terrible, and it deserved to be cancelled. Dirk Benedict's face was like, fuck that, I'm not coming back. And I don't think Richard Hatch even came back for much of either. Cowboy Bebop, 
starring John Cho. Netflix version of the classic anime was largely hated by fandom. However, if you hadn't seen the an- anime, like me, I really liked it. And it definitely got Five Five vibes going on. And Ben's waving and you know, he liked it as well. It looked amazing. So, of course, it was cancelled. Stargate Universe. Imagine Star Trek Voyager, but it's Stargate where a group of people on the ship need to get home. It starred Robert Carlyle as a shifty scientist, and it was really decent. So, of course, it got cancelled after one season, when every other Stargate show got about seven seasons and 22 episodes. Willow. Available for about six months and then thrown to oblivion and not available anywhere, despite the end of it promising us two more seasons. Now, I was really annoyed with this because Willow was getting better and better by the episode. Had a great cast, and it was funny. It's so rare to get funny fantasy, and it really had amazing Buffy vibes when you got to that last scene of the final episode Angel, I mean we got five seasons and after what we know now which was speculated and confirmed about Joss Whedon it's probably best it did end but also it went out in a blaze of glory but there is an official season 6 comic called After the Fall which is great, We're definitely worth picking up and reading if you want to see where the story goes afterwards speaking of problematic people, still Whedon The Nevers, his last show about Victorian superpowered ladies got shut down during Covid and he also got shut down during COVID as well, and stepped away. But the show was really fun, had a great cast, and then it had such an outrageous mid-season twist that I had to check I was watching the same show, and then I still wasn't sure until other characters finally came back into it. I was like, what what have I just watched? It was was one of the craziest twists I've seen. Because you're watching a, a, a Victorian fantasy show, and then suddenly it's a completely different show. And finally, Vinyl, a collab between Martin Scorsese, HBO and Terrence Winter from The Sopranos about the cutthroat music industry in 1970s New York, starring Bobby Cannavale, Olivia Wilde and Juno Temple. It was really good, despite Mick Jagger's son being in it and not being very good. And that course got one season. And brief. As an American who grew up with my so-called life, I am mm-hmm. shocked that was just one season. It felt yeah. like so much longer. Uh, of course, it was probably when episode, there was 24 episodes per season. But I was just like, that was such a big deal back then. Like, Claire Danes really blew up because of that. Yeah. Yeah, man. She exploded. When you... (laughs) (laughs) Right, we are almost ready to start the list. But first, we have our honourable mentions. Marie, what shows would you like to mention that are not in our top ten? The first ones on my honourable mentions um, is Dead Like Me, which I think is the oldest show that I have on this list. Um, And it's the one that I saw like ages, ages, ages ago when I was a teenager. But it was really good. And the concept was that when you die, you come back as a Grim Reaper and you have to like help people to their deaths. And you followed like this teenage girl who was a teenage girl and didn't want to be there. And the concept was amazing. Um, And it definitely deserved more seasons. I remember she, uh, um, George, her name was, and she got killed by a toilet, toilet from it, a spacecraft i saw that yeah i saw it, a amazing episodes. show i still recommend it even though it doesn't like have like a proper conclusion it did get a movie yeah i think they finish it off in a movie but again i think a lot of the cast oh. have moved on so yeah so uh, Dead i like quite... me afterlife i believe is a movie yeah yeah and i believe i did see it but i don't remember it as well as i do the show mm. um and then, like, second one on my list is A League of Their Own, which was a remake of the movie. And uh, it was Amazon Prime. It, I think, came out two years ago. Once again, it was a queer show that got cancelled after one season. And I'm not into sports, so if a sports show, like, catches my attention, um, it, it's saying something. But, yes, it, it was the story about when, like, all the men went off to war and the women had to pick up the work and one of them was being, like... Um, starting a baseball team because they still wanted to keep morale up. And yeah, I thought it was a great show. The costuming was adorable. Uh, The characters were really good. And it also ended on a kind of a cliffhanger. So I thought it definitely deserved a second season. And I think it was in general just planned like a two seasons. They weren't like planning on making this like a very long show. So that's another reason why the cancellation was so disappointing. And... Now, this one, the next one is, like, I generally think, like, I do recommend even checking this out, even though it just has one season. It's a Netflix show, of course, and that is Teenage Bounty Hunters. This is a phenomenal show because it's so funny. It is fucking hilarious. It's about, like, these teenage twins who decide to become bounty hunters and hunt down, like, criminals. And even that, if that concept doesn't make you, like... Like, oh, okay, that sounds a bit strange. It is. It's meant to be strange. It's funny. It's just, it was edited so, like, it had a very unique style to it. So the editing was very unique. 
Um, and it also ended on a fucking cliffhanger. And yeah, I really want to know what happens next. And that is like a very, I think it was also one of Netflix's best performing shows of that year. And the fact that it got canceled, it was very disappointing. Once again, queer and it got canceled. I'm going to be repeating that a lot. And then um, another one uh, was Paper Girls, which I think came out two years ago. I really liked the show. I thought it was um, interesting. I liked the concept, except I, and again, was shocked when it got canceled. Then I read the comic and kind of understood that they kind of went into their very own direction. But in my defense, I, I, like, I think in their defense, adapting the comic loyally i don't i don't sure it's a very weird comic it's a very weird comic it it has a, like pterodactyls and it's um like yeah yeah but it has dinosaurs <laughs> oh the comic is also really uh fun but the show i think was also uh quite fun and i think the young actors did such a good job because it's a time tra travel show so there were two versions there was an old version and a young version of the characters and yeah it definitely deserved a second season even if it wasn't loyal to the comics and finally even though i know they're technically coming back but when this first happened i was very upset and that was canceling all the mcu netflix shows Except for Iron Fist, that can go fuck itself. Uh, but all the other <laughs> with its own, ones, oh, with its Iron it's Fist, shit, man, Iron Fist is pure garbage. It's so bad. Come on, <laughs> everyone dumps on that show, and I fucking loved it. I get like it was like it was an epic version of Hollywood whitewashing. I understand it was like cast wrong, but it was really fun. Like it was, oh, go fine. And my favourite out of all those MCU shows was um, The Punisher. I just thought John Burfell was so so superb as it. And hopefully, and we know he's coming back for uh, Daredevil mm. Wall again. So. Jessica Jones. And I mean, they're rumours. We uh, like so like I'm really hoping she's coming back. But like I was really disappointed I that Jessica Jones got cancelled. I saw the first season of Jessica Jones. They they did a really great job with the first season of her. Mm -hmm. That got me hooked. First season was was. David Tennant was the bad guy. That's that it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so good. good. But so the good. second season wasn't as good. Like, I it have just to admit, wasn't. the second season like, wasn't so good. But That's where I dropped off it wasn't. the second season. Because I, I loved Defenders. I thought that was fucking excellent. I thought they brought the characters mm -hmm. together really well. It was really good fun. Like, it was, like, I, I mean, it's a TV show. You're not going to get a Le Avengers level, like, like stuff out of it. But, you know, like, they made some bold moves in it. I was like, all right, cool. You're going to maybe kill off a character. And Sigourney Weaver was in it. It was fucking brilliant. Everyone dumps on it because it comes out, like, the competition for it was so hard. Like, and I was like, you guys, fine, whatever. I'll just be a little I comic book nerd enjoying comic book it movies and better shows. And the final, what, they were fighting inside of a dragon? That was not, I don't. Think I mean it, it's comic book, but still it's and also you couldn't see anything. It was very dark. Uh <laughs> they weren't fighting inside of a dragon. What what they what fighting, was it? They were fighting for the dragon's blood. And they were fighting in the in the basement of this building that then ends, ends up falling down, maybe possibly on top of one of the characters, so I don't get fucking shot by the spoiler police. <laughs> I don't know. It was yeah, it was dark. I, I didn't realize I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Speaking of not knowing what's going on, David. Oh, hello. <laughs> your, yes. your, your free, your free shows, mate. Uh, my first. Well, no, one, we're just trying to say three. Sorry, I went it's... down the list. <laughs> what well, your I... list? Your list is You there. supplied more than three, Marie. You got to talk more than three. <laughs> you, you did good, Marie. Um, my my first one isn't like a proper TV show, I suppose. It's did anyone I mean, it watch the Crystal Maze? Jose, yes. did they have the Crystal Maze when you was a a a, a, a wee nip? <clears throat> I don't Back in 1990. Bear in mind, it's a British game show, Jose. Uh, David. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. That's why I'm this. asking Jose if, if our American listeners had, had, the, had the crystal made. So basically, Jose, you get a group of people, like families, if you will, or friends, and everybody just goes into their own little rooms and they have to do puzzles and they get little crystals at the end of it. And these puzzles could be like physical puzzles, they could be like maths puzzles, they could be anything. And at the end of it, they go into a big crystal and they've got to catch. All of the all of the leaflets. They gotta catch all the leaflets, Jose. And then the leaflets into this into this like little uh little little leaflet. Trap door. Tra yeah, 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 that's the word. And uh and then at the end of it they get money. 
Uh, All right. Can I, can I just give an show. overview? Can I give a, a quick overview so it doesn't sound like a, a fever dream that David has? <laughs> <laughs> so teams of people uh, go around four areas, right? One person at a time has to go into a into a room and solve a puzzle with the help of the people on the outside guiding them. So it could be a physical puzzle where you've got to do something physical. It could be a mental puzzle where you where you've got to like you know, like you like use like your brain to like figure stuff out. Um, and there's, there's all these different categories. Every, you've got a certain amount of time in the room. And once that time runs out, you either get out, like you freed the crystal from the puzzle and you get out with the crystal. Um, or you, you get out, you don't solve, you don't solve the puzzle and you get out of the room or you run out of time in the room and you get locked into the room. So you go around and you do all these games and then each crystal gives you 10 seconds of time in the giant crystal at the end, right? And the idea is to get as many crystals as you can so that you've got as much time as possible in the giant, like, ball, which is full up with gold and silver, like, tokens that giant fans blow around and you've got to catch them out of the air. Every time you put a gold one through the, through the trap door, you get 10 points. And every time you put a silver one through the door, you lose 10 points. So at the end, even the last game, oh, and if you want to, the more people you've got in that ball at the end, the more leaflets you're going to collect. So if you've got people locked in the rooms, you've got to use your crystals to buy them out. The whole you, thing was mental. Yeah, you 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 guys got that from what I said, right? You, that's the, uh... <laughs> I mean, like... The... Both descriptions was equal uh, equal fever dream level. Like it wasn't ben, excellent. <laughs> did you write the Wikipedia for the Crystal Maze? <laughs> I don't know. I might, I might as well have. The one thing uh, that no one mentioned I... though, uh, Richard O'Brien was a host in the original OG show. Yeah, yeah, and it was uh, rebooted. And Richard Ayodi, I can never say his last name properly. Ayodi, Ayodi, Edward. See, everyone's, <laughs> there's three different pronunciations. Edward. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, but also, there back. was a yeah. The there IT was also dude. A, a, there was also another version where um, uh, Ed Tudor Pole took over uh, after Richard O'Brien. That's not so, a real uh, name, Ben. Uh, it is. He was the singer for the Sex Pistols after uh, Johnny Rotten left. He did he did the second Sex Pistols album? This this is a great honorable mention, by the way. This is uh, great. I did. I, I did. Like... I did a gig with him once. I did a show with him once. He was a lovely man. Uh, he was, uh, everybody was told not to talk about the crystal maze in front of him. Uh, and, you know, like uh, like TV stars, and uh, they tell you not to talk about stuff or look him in the eyes. He was trying to get into the backstage door when I was stood next to him and he was punching the code in and he got it wrong. And I went, oh, you'd be shit on the crystal maze, mate. And he just looked at me and burst, <laughs> burst into laughter. And then the whole rest of the day, he just started telling the stories about the crystal maze. He was smoking a cigarette backstage and flicking the ash into his cowboy boot that he was still wearing. Like oh, was my fucking, God. he was he was cool as fuck. Really lovely guy. The best thing about the Crystal Maze as well, guys, and I think I wanna I wanna pitch this to everybody is we can do it as an experience. Team bonding oh. all of us <laughs> in London or where I think it's in London. Crystal Maze experience, guys. Who's that? Might be a little tough for Who's me in? to get I'm there. In. I'm in. Same. Neil. I'm in. That's Neil. right. We'll start. We'll start a crowd. I'm in, but we'll start a crowdfunder to uh, to get our international hosts into the UK. Yeah, they'll get 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 on it because you, you know. <clears> well, you, I feel you, like you with for... Marie, it, it, with travel and things, it's easier for her. I mean, she's easier, in Europe. Yeah, yeah still, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's just across a pond. Come on, you got trains, right? Trains. No, uh, not, not really. from Lisbon. Not from yeah. From Portugal. <laughs> you just take the long way. Oh my god, <laughs> David! Your next show. Please. Well, anyway, Neil, you little cocksucker. Um... I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my next show is Dead Word, which I, explains I'm your intro to me. There, doesn't it? I do spat tea all over my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I was a uh, proper oh, scrape in the God. barrel with with my uh, like the first segways. Show. Yeah, yeah. No, not my segway. I thought I was we're good. We met, again, where we went to the, do segways. The shows. <laughs> 
that, that I'd actually watched that had been cancelled because apparently there weren't that many of them. And Deadwood was one of them that I'd only, I was probably the reason why it got cancelled because I only watched about two or two seasons of the show. And but I never watched the movie. List? Because I was scraping the barrel, Marie. I was just saying, I, I was so many shows that I had that I was like, I like that show. Why did I stop watching it? Um, and I wasn't watching it at the time. I watched it after the time. And then other things come along, Marie. I, I don't know, Marie. What happens in life? Um, <laughs> but anyway, I the whole... Uh, fun fact for you. The word fuck in Deadwood is said 2,980 times. And the word in cocksucker... In one episode. Neil, you little cocksucker. Is what? Uh, what? 280 Jeez. times. Jesus. So... At this point, David's <laughs> going to say that that many times in this podcast we have a parental advisory warning at the beginning of the show <laughs> i have to click the sorry, David, thing when i upload it's, it's it. fine yeah it's fine david's a parent we're all we're all covered <laughs> yeah that's how that works <laughs> you wouldn't think it that i'm the one that's a dad here but they, yeah. there you go and david the last thing before we oh uh, well, i can't even remember what it was mate what was it rome Ro- oh yeah, Rome. Rome was a great fucking show. Rome. Um, not only like if you look at like IMDb or like Rotten Tomatoes, like we were saying earlier, really high scores. I don't know why this got cancelled. Because it cost a I shit ton of probably money. Probably should have done my research into why it got cancelled. Actually, but um, Rome was basically like Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones was a thing. It, it was like uh, I think it was about Julius Caesar's civil war. And uh, like the it, like Rome becoming a dictatorship, and it would follow two like the two two Roman soldiers, and it was all about like power within the families. It was a fucking amazing show, Rome. Like, have you guys seen Rome? Uh no. Yeah. I think I was on the seat on the high seas when it came out. I mean, if I didn't just sell it, I don't know what will. That was. Uh, I feel like that was uh, anything pitch. else. I feel like that was perfect <laughs> salesmanship there from me. There was. I keep trying to say there's, there was an unnerving amount of rape in that show, though. Like, yeah, was, like, yeah, yeah. It, it oh. was, I was like, like great, to the yeah. point where it like disturbed me, and I had to stop watching for a minute because I was just like, "All right, fuck." Yeah, that's there why I some, didn't watch yeah. it. Yeah. We actually little, have uh, season soldiers. one on DVD back when that was still a thing. Um, but DVD still a thing. <laughs> I just bought actually... this. Well, oh, it's invisible on the screen because it, it's <laughs> an invisible <laughs> magic. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> there we go. The Hitcher. Oh, Rockahawa. It's funny. Yeah. I actually got made fun of because uh, I went to a friend's house and I brought a couple DVDs to watch just in case. And they're like, Always "What are you like, right now. 80? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Well, these are good movies. Why not?" You know, physical nah. media, man. Fuck you, streamers. Even though right. Gonna... <laughs> yeah, fuck them because they're the ones that cancel these shows. Exactly, and then make stuff unavailable to get. Ben, your free show. Hello. Thank you. I was just writing notes. My three shows. I'm going to start off with, uh, this is a weird order because I put them in a weird order and Neil just copied them straight onto the notes. But I'll start off with Veronica Mars. Um, I don't include the reboot. I thought like that that was a different thing. Like it just fucking stopped. Like four seasons in as well. Like when you get four seasons in on something, was was it four seasons? Four seasons total? I think it, it was and three. there was a reboot. It was three seasons, and then the, the there was a rebooted season, and then and then the movie. I quite enjoyed the movie, um, but yeah. So the three seasons. Thank you, Marie. Um, it just it just stops. Like it, you don't really get anything. Nothing gets resolved, no, and it. But it was it was really well acted. It had some great people in it. It was dark where it needed to be dark. It was light where it needed to be light. It dealt with some really heavy teen issues that, like, I don't think anything else was kind of brave enough to go that far into at the time. Like, you had shows, you know, you had, like, the throwaway shows, like um, One Tree Hill and The O.C. and stuff, which just, like, dealt with the melodrama. And then you had, like, the, the Buffies and stuff that dealt with, like, the darker side of, like, teen life. And I'm sure there are many, many others that I never watched. But for me, Veronica Mars was, like, gritty. It dealt with a lot of, like, really, really important... Um, things that teams were going through and it should cast a lot of light onto that and so it throws a lifeline out that then just gets sort of snapped away the movie then comes along to sort of tie it all up and the whole world has moved on and it's not really a team thing anymore it's just like wrapping up these characters to you know, as like a band-aid on what you were kind of like trying to trying to sort of um resolve in your own mind 
Um, so yeah, so Veronica Mars is the first one on my list. Did anybody else watch it? Yeah, I, I'm a huge Veronica Mars fan. I actually re-watched it last year because I watched it when I was a teenager and then last year I was like in the mood for it. I don't like season three, I have to admit. Um, I do like, uh, uh, but one and two, I think are just peak television. Um, mm. I haven't seen the movie in a while, uh, but I did remember enjoying it because I watched it all in one when I was uh, checking out the uh, show for the first time. And then the reboot, I actually quite enjoyed the reboot, except for the last, like, what was it, 10 minutes where they made a phenomenally stupid decision. And I generally do not understand why they made this decision. And based on, like, the like other fans, I, I, I'm not in the minority here. So, mm. yeah. Um, but I do agree, like, the original series, especially season one and two, um, and uh, more season one, because season one is, I think, peak television. It is really, really good. Like, it has a really mm. good mystery, um, but not just a really good mystery, a really good way the mystery gets solved, because that's also really important. Uh, and yeah. um, the characters are hilarious. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I always advise anyone to check out Veronica Mars. Like, it's a good show. Yeah, agreed. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, so then my second one uh, is a show called Reaper, which was yes. a comedy show. Um, and like it was actually Neil, it was you that turned me onto it. Um, like back in the day, you're like, You've got to watch Reaper. And I was like, Shut up, don't tell me what to do. And then I watched it anyway. <laughs> that doesn't sound um, like Neil. And Shut it, up, David. You know what? It so sounds a hell of a lot like me, though. I think we can spoil Reaper, man. It's never coming back, is it? Let's be but, honest. I mean, Shut up, Jose. I don't think. I don't think I, yeah, I'm gonna read right I'm gonna read Jose in a minute. Oh I'm gonna Okay, re I'm not gonna jump in on that because <laughs> I, I I'm gonna oh, virtually yeah. smash him in the head with this. I've just realised, Jose, have you has your shirt got your hometown on it, just in case you forget where you live? It's, what is it? <laughs> oh team. it's the bucket oh, okay. Okay, it's the Buccaneers, okay. <laughs> yeah. That was almost <laughs> a really good burn, David. Almost. <laughs> ben, tell I, us about Reaper. So I'm, just, I'm actually just going to read the overview um, from uh, from Google. So it, it is pretty good. So when he was going through his teen years, Sam often wondered why his parents never seemed to mind his slacking off, although they always pressured his kid brother Keith to excel. When he turns 21, however, Sam makes an ungodly discovery. His parents sold his soul to the devil before he was born. When Satan pops uh, in to explain that Sam is going to have to serve as his bounty hunter, tracking down escaped evil souls and returning them to hell... Sam's first reaction is to tell is to tell Satan to go to well home, but it quickly dawns on him that the breaking a deal with the devil is likely to have more serious consequences than getting grounded. Before you can say, "Is it just me or is it hot in here?" Sam embarks on a dangerous and often terrifying new gig as the Reaper, assisted by his fellow slackers Ben and Sock, as well as Andy, Sam's girlfriend. Brett Harrison played Sam Oliver. Now, like he pops up in stuff from time to time, and I'm like, "That's the kid from Reaper." Couldn't tell you what else he's been in, though. But it had Ray Wise as the devil, who was oh, just... Good, good, yeah. He was so funny, so tongue-in-cheek. So He was almost like a like a wise guy version of the devil. Tyler Labine um, was in it. Uh, he is, if you've watched... He's in a show called New Amsterdam. He plays the psychologist, the head of psychology in New Amsterdam. He's phenomenal in that. He was also in Tucker and Dale versus, Dale versus Evil. evil. Yeah, with, um, with Adam Tudyk. He, and he's, I just think he's fantastic in everything he does. Uh, interestingly enough, um, Kevin Smith was in it. Um, uh... And yeah, it doesn't tell you on here what he played, but he was in it. And I, and I remember seeing him and I think, oh, that's cool. And that made me kind of invest in me in the show a little bit more. So it's, it was a really good show. Um, and it, it ends again on a cliffhanger. Um, it's, you know, like Sam's trying to break the deal, stop being the Reaper, and he comes close, and then he can't, you know, he has to, uh, like, keep, you know, stay in the in the Reaping game because one of his friends is going to get killed or blah, blah, whatever happens. But, it, again, it was just really, really fun. It was, like, it was just a solid show for me. And, yeah, two seasons, that was it. That's all we got. Anybody else watch it? I watched the first series, but it was 2007, so I literally watched it, and then I was off for years and not in the country when it was on. And then it was gone by the time we came back. I never realised there was two mm. seasons of it. So if it's ever going to mm. be on like a streaming thing somewhere, I will definitely watch the second. I'll watch it all again, probably. Because it was that 
like you say, I don't know, was Kevin Smith involved in like directing some of the pilot as well? Maybe I think because he was. I, think, yeah, probably, him, I, don't, I don't know about. I don't know about the pilot, but he was definitely involved. Like, involved in it. And, he was and in, it had that so. it had that kind of slacker clerks vibe to it as well, wasn't it? Had that real kind of slacker very much so. slacker. Yeah. I remember I remember it being totally my bag when it came out. That's probably why I recommended it to you, Ben. They work I think they yeah, they work in like a like a Home Depot, like B and Q kind of place as well. So like you've got that innovative ways of slacking off, which is yeah, it was great. But yeah, that was um that was that was a favorite of mine for a while. But this last one that I'm gonna talk about was my was one of my out of these three was my favorite out of all these three uh mainly because i have an enormous crush or had an enormous crush on eliza Dusku, uh and the show was called true calling who didn't <laughs> right exactly. the girl next door um underrated yeah. movie no wrong uh, wrong person, Jose. Wrong, <laughs> person. Wow. wrong Jose. oh wait Dusku. that's eliza cuthbert that's You're cuthbert right. You're thinking... from 24 yeah what's the chiller movie yeah, with so with think, uh, what's her name no, bring it stop on. talking about cheerleaders. Stop talking about cheerleaders. Bring it on. <laughs> bring bring it's it on as is, uh, is Elijah Disco. But she was uh she was yeah. she played Faith in Buffy Faith. the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um so all right, so true calling. So so she works in a morgue and Zach Gavanakis was the was the there was the head morgue guy. Mortician. So what would ha- what sure, if that's what you want to call him. When True Davis, oh that was it, she has got the same surname as me, so I was like, yeah. Um, when True Davis starts working at a city morgue, she learns that she can go back in time for one day to help change the fates of both strangers uh, and those close to her. True, assisted by Harrison, her, <clears throat> her irresponsible younger brother, and Davis, her loyal friend, that's Gallif uh, and confidant. So, yeah, so what would happen is that the body would come into the morgue. Um, she would like, she would go, oh no, this guy was shot to death, and that's terrible. And then the character, the, the 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 body would reach out to her, grab her, and say, "Help me!" And then she'd zip back in time to the start of the day, and she'd be like, "Right, and now I've got to find that human person and help them to not either not get shot or find out who did it, or you know, however it sort of pans out." So it's like a non. So it's like the creepy version of early edition, basically. Oh, where wow. Carl Chandler yeah. would get the newspaper and he'd get, and he'd be able to do it the day before. Yeah, yeah. So she's like, so like, or obviously, like the first time it happens, it's like, oh no, this is terrible. What's happening to me? Uh, but by the time like she gets into the swing of things, she's like pays attention to everything that that is the, on the body. She does the autopsy as quick as possible, and then when she gets sent back in time, she can like help help that person not die. Uh, Jason Priestley is in it, and he plays the opposite of her character. And he has to like he's the one trying to kill these people or make sure that their fate actually happens to them. So it gets a little bit like it gets a little bit crazy in there. But uh, yeah, I was gonna I, I was gonna show. ask, mate, because I think I because I watched a few of them and I was like, because you know, obviously Eliza the Skew, but then it was a procedural, and I was like, so every week, and I was, and I, I kind of got a bit bored by it, and I never got through to the second. Mm-hmm. Week. Was there a be- was there like an overreaching arc that kind of came in, or was it still just murder yeah. of the week? Yeah, so it was Murder of the Week, and then second season when Jason Priestley came into it, you find out that they're like he's working against her, and then that gives you the the story arc for the season. Oh, okay. So he would pop in like every couple of episodes and like be like, "Ha, I'm working up. against you." Yeah, he would like <laughs> throw Spanish in the works. But that guy, Zach Galifianakis in it, brilliant. Just was it a comedic role then, Zach Galifianakis? Was it? He was like he had like a, he had a crush on you know uh, True. And you know he was he would like help her, and she, she, I think she became she tells him about her powers, and he's like the only one that sort of believes her. Um, I think, and I think that the true's character was like a failed doctor or something, which is why she's in, like why she's in the morgue. I could be because she can't kill people because she can't kill people. Um, yeah, so yeah, good, another good show, but I really enjoyed it, and it was right at the height of the the Eliza Dushku just coming off of Buffy and doing like you know just being great. Now, Jose, I believe one of the sh- your first show you're going to talk about has the other person in it who you just badly got confused with. Actually, there's <laughs> two shows with two characters that are two actresses that we've mentioned already. <sighs> Jose, who is one of the lead actresses in Happy Endings? The first show you're going to talk about. Elisha Cuthbert. <laughs> but yes. another show that I was going to mention, which... Uh, but that's next! Can... So wait, wait. So start with your first one. Don't... I didn't want to start with Happy Endings, though. I want to start with Girl Boss. You always want to start with Happy Endings. No, you end with happy endings. 
He's right. got it there. <laughs> Just do it your order. Just do it your way, oh. Jose. All right. Uh, let's cut. <laughs> yes, happy endings with Elisha Cuthbert. <laughs> Uh, funny enough, she was uh, along with um, who is now actually a pretty big star, Eliza Coop, and Damon Wayans Jr. At the time, he was pretty new. Uh, he was actually going between uh, New Girl and then ended up getting this show and left New Girl. But uh, there's other characters. Uh, it, that show, I think, was like a Friends, but with everyone being as dumb as Joey. <laughs> it was it was literally just like everyone had a quirky scenario. Um, very few moments of actually smart ideas, but it just was just the right kind of funny. And so, I mean, that's all I could say. It had three seasons, but it just kind of kept barely getting each season. And I think it could have just gone a couple more seasons and it, it was hilarious. Um, uh, so Zachary Knighton, Casey Wilson, who I think is, SNL? One of the... I don't know. No, I don't think so. She was on SNL. Yeah. One was season. she? Yeah. Oh Yeah. But like she, her character, I think was probably one of my favorites because she just had uh, funny sayings that I think were the precursor to what teenagers do now with their shortening of words and making no sense. Um, and it was kind of like <laughs> you're getting teenagers confused with Australians. Uh, <laughs> and Ad- Sunnies. Yeah, and then this Adam Pally or pa- Polly, um, he's become kind Pally, of Pally. Like a nice mid star. But I, what his character was he was gay but like he was stereotypically opposite of good looking gay he was uh poor and unkempt and had uh, again others any uh ideas when he ended up being a chef on a food truck which i thought Spoilers, I, just... Jose. <laughs> I know i know but yeah this this show like when you look at individual moments it's just you're like well, i don't get it but then when you watch the entire season and the cast coming together they just had really great rapport and it's just really fun, dumb humor. So yeah, I, I remember just... watching this, man. I enjoyed this yeah. decent show. And then Alicia Cuthbert again. I have to mention twice. <laughs> and a uh, yes again, Jose. You have something with people called Elijah here, don't you? Yes. Uh, this one is the one I'm surprised didn't make the cut. It was called Dollhouse. It had two seasons on Fox, and it was that's smart. why. It, it was just it was too much for uh, executives to understand. Um, I don't know if you recognize names. Amy Acker, Fran Cans, they were really great. Um, Dude, it's everyone from Buffy and Angel. Mostly yeah, Angel. basically. Yeah. This was a Joss uh, Whedon show. Joss Whedon. Uh, yeah, which is probably why I didn't make the cut. <laughs> there you go. It, it was basically beautiful people who are secret agents, but then their memories are wiped, so they're like fresh robots. And there was a lot of action and conspiracies. And the whole, like, the whole premise was it wasn't just missions, but the overall arc was that there was more to this uh, agency than was was first, you know, kind of given. You know, you think, oh, it's just an agency and this is how they do things. But then you realize they're very shady, obviously. And then uh, in the second season, uh, I think was one of my favorite parts was Alan Tudyk got involved. Yes, he was and awesome in it. I, I, I don't remember everything, but just the fact that he had like uh, as a villain, he had a villain role and that was really cool. You don't really see Alan Tudyk as an evil guy. Well, a couple of times more recently, but um, he, he's just a great character actor and he just brought a lot to it. I mean, he's good as a chicken. <laughs> yes, he got yeah, paid Moana, it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think there was just so much potential that they, they knew they had, but then executives decided to cut it, you know. Or just other reasons, honestly. Fucking but Fox, I, man. Fucking Fox. Right? And then the last one, I it was think really was cerebral, just... though. It was really before, like it was really, really oh, clever. Yeah. And and like and this part of the problem was it was probably a little bit too clever. I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they, it's funny how executives don't think audiences. Yeah, are you're right. To keep going. Yeah. yeah. The first part of the <laughs> just leave it at that. Yeah. They just don't <laughs> think. They don't think. But but that is a good point because uh, like so many like smart shows come out and then they like either they cancel it or they dumb it down in like season two or three uh three it's like yeah yeah Yeah. the majority of the world people are stupid but we're smart (laughs) (laughs) clearly clearly especially if you listen to this this podcast yes yes (laughs) we're making a great impression here and jose um your last show you're going to talk about i have a fun fact that will blow your mind about this show afterwards when you tell me oh okay so the last one uh, I think is the most niche and probably most surprising for me personally that I, I would assume no one would have guessed I like this show 
It's called Girl Boss from 2017. Uh, one of my few newer shows uh, from Netflix. It starred Britt Robinson and RuPaul. It's loosely based on the story f f uh, from an online fashion mogul. Uh, she basically would sell vintage clothing for a profit. And, and honestly, the show was just bottom line. Sh it was carried by Robertson. She was such a great actress and she had such awesome charisma. Uh, if you don't know where she's from, I think the most famous thing she's done re is Tomorrowland with the. OK, I might be wrong about that, but I, I feel like I recognize her the most from Tomorrowland with George Clooney. Uh, she was in Tomorrowland. She was the lead in Tomorrowland, and I, I, I don't know. It's just it, the show really used her personality to, to make the show great. Um, that, that's basically all I can think of. So my fun fact, Jose, uh, bizarre, bizarre small world that we live in. Britt Robertson got married to a friend of my yoga teacher. Are you serious? Because my, my yoga teacher was like, oh, yeah, we're going over. Because I was like, why haven't we got a class like on the beach next week? And she's like, oh, I'm going to the States for a friend's wedding. Yeah, he's marrying some actress from like in, um, wherever. Wow. And oh, what's her name? Oh, Britt Robertson. Oh, yeah, I looked her up. Because I hadn't seen the show, so I've not heard of her. Wow. And then, yeah, so there you go. That's what's fun. Ben's reaction brings me perfectly onto my free, the first of my free shows I want to talk about briefly, didn't make the thing. And that show, Brent, is Brain Dead. Now, I have to mention this. It's a political satire sci-fi show from 2016 called Brain Dead. It stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Everything should star Mary Elizabeth Winstead. So imagine if you can cross the West Wing and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And many of the jokes in, relied on the fact that in Washington, most people don't realize that the other people are being controlled by space bugs. That's kind of the joke. And they do hammer it into the ground a little bit. Tonally, the show was all over the place, which is definitely why it got cancelled. But Winstead was great as lol. She just wants to make documentaries about indigenous cultures. Instead, she has to end up working for her sleazy senator brother, Luke. And you've got the great Tony Shalhoub in it, playing a southern Republican senator who's almost as bad before the space bugs take his brain. Uh, but the single greatest thing about this show is the previously on Brain Dead recap songs by this single songwriter guy called Jonathan Coulson. The songs are better than anything in the show. And they're more entertaining than the shows himself. In the 12 songs he did, he not only recaps the show, but each recap, they get wilder and crazier. Uh, one, he decides to recap an episode of Gunsmoke instead. Because why not? And so they flash up previously on Gunsmoke. And then he narrates what happens in that show. Another episode, he just doesn't want to do it anymore. And just like he's drunkenly laying there. Another episode, he breaks the fourth wall. And the characters in the show tell him to shut up because he's outside busking on their porch. It's great. And there is a super cut of this on YouTube. So in about 24 minutes, you can watch the, all these songs back to back, which will basically tell you the whole plot of the show. And you go, this show looks really good. And then you watch it and it's not as good. But these songs were awesome. <laughs> Brain Dead, brilliant show, but not really. But the songs are great. American Gothic. We're going to go back to 1995 for a show that was so far ahead of its time. It was created by a guy called Sean Cassidy and produced by Sam Raimi, his first time doing TV. And it had nothing to do with painting. But it was a forerunner to shows like American Horror Story and that the show was darkly violent and went really hard for 1995. Gary Cole, who you remember from Office Space and generally everything, being like, you know, the happy kind of Brady Bunch, that kind of guy. In this, he plays Sheriff Lucas Black, who is basically the devil. Uh, he rapes a local woman, Judith Temple, in front of her daughter. And then she eventually gives birth to a son called Caleb Temple. In the pilot episode, Lucas kills his sister in front of him and then convinces his dad that he did it and to commit suicide. And then he wants to raise Caleb in his own demonic image. That is a lot of rape and murder for the first episode of a show. Jeez. That was a network show back in the mid nineties. But I think Sam Raimi's kind of cash as it were is what got it on the air. And it was fucking scary, man. Like it was um, the kid in it actually grew up to be uh, well, Lucas Black who were uh, from the Fast and the Furious films. So that Southern guy, this was him as a kid, and he's really good as a kid in it. Gary Cole is superb. It's just this magnetic, murdering, demonic piece of shit in it. He's so nasty in the film. Sarah Paulson, who was in all the American Horror Story stuff, this was one of her really early roles. She plays a ghost in it. And the basic kind of story of the whole first series is Caleb's cousin comes to town and to uncover the truth about her parents' death, you can guess who killed him. And the whole show kind of becomes this tug of war for the soul of the young kid. And is he going to be a devil man like his father? Or is he going to be good like his ghost sister? It's just, it sounds weird when I say it like that, but it's such a dark, dark show. Some of the jump scares in it for a TV show, David, honestly, they're up there with The Haunting of Hill House. And it had some brilliant guest stars. Bruce Campbell obviously turns up in one episode because it's a Sam Raimi joint, so he has to. 
And uh, just the opening titles with that, there's somebody at the door. Oh, fucking scary. And it made me laugh because actually there's a bit where they're going, there's somebody at the door in Agatha all along. And I was like, ah, oh, this was definitely scarier in American Gothic about 30 years ago. Final show I want to mention is one we briefly mentioned, which is Mindhunter. So, yeah, created by Joe Pennell and show run and directed by David Fincher. Mindhunter is a strange one for this list because it's actually more down to Fincher's availability and delays between seasons that ultimately sank Mindhunter rather than it being outright cancelled. The show starred Jonathan Groff as Holden Ford, Holt McAnally as Bill Tench, both agents in a nascent FBI behavioural science unit, which led to the profiling of serial killers as their department and work gather steam. Anna Torf from Fringe, awesome, joins as Wendy Carr and she's added to the unit. I mean, come on, serial killers and Fincher, right? This is just obviously going to work. And it's a great slow-burning arc. And it kind of has this serial killer of the week format where Holden and Bill begin to question famous incarcerated killers. And then they begin to put together profiles to catch current killers. Uh, season one standout was Cameron Britton's chilling portrayal of Edward Kemper, who was the first to assist them with their work. And what I like is as the season goes on, we learn more about Holden and Bill's personal lives. There's that kind of little hint in season two that Bill's kid might be a bit strange himself and have some serial killer tendencies. He starts worrying that he's seeing that in his son. And in season two, we have actor Damien Herriman, who Marie plays the baddie in The Artful Dodger. That oh. guy, um, this is him. He plays Charles Manson. And fun fact, Jose... He plays Charles Manson twice in two years. He played Charles Manson in this, and he also played him in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for Tarantino as well. Oh, hey, if, wow. If you're not going to be like a key, a main role and you're just going to be in it briefly, why not get Charles Manson? Get the same <laughs> actor to play Charles Manson. Um, season three was planned in 2019, but it was put on hold until fin Fincher finishes work on the film Mank. Originally, Fincher had planned out five seasons, but in January 2020, Netflix said the cast had been released from their contracts because basically Fincher was too busy with other projects and the show was put on a definite hold. Last we heard in February 2023, Fincher said the series was officially done, sadly. So a rare occasion, it's actually David Fincher's fault and not Netflix's. So not Flix, not to blame for a change. The lead guy in that, the other lead guy, David Gruff, is it? Jonathan Gruff. Jonathan Gruff. He was the, yeah. he played the king in Hamilton. Yeah. If you've yeah. seen Hamilton. Yeah. 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 He, Who he hasn't was, seen Hamilton? Like, I'll be back. Yeah. We can't do it because we haven't got a license for it. It will get in trouble. But, uh, yes, because yeah. of video now, David. So you can't do it. Yeah. YouTube will take the video down. I was going to do it, but then I got scared. You guys threatened me. <laughs> With a DMCA takedown. I kill your friends and family. <laughs> to remind you of our love. And I believe you know how many seconds of stuff we can use before we have to pay money or get sued. That I was mean, under it, right? Doesn't no offense to Dave. Singing, I was about to say, I think it has to be a fairly accurate representation. Oh, come on. Yeah. That was like on point. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with us, everyone. And here we are. We are now at our top 10. And as we said before, if we have a tie, we're just going to mention all the shows that are tied for the same amount of points. Because the whole point of this podcast is to tell you about all the shows that have been cruelly cancelled. And at number 10, of course, we have our first tie. And at number 10, Blood Drive. So before he was Jack Reacher, Alan Rickson was that fucking cop. That's the title of the first episode. That's not just, you know, a statement of fact. Uh, he played a cop, Arthur Bailey, in a dystopian future sci-fi grindhouse horror show called Blood Drive, where, yes, cars run on blood. And by the end of the first episode, he has to take part in a race across America in tow with a femme fatale grace played by Christina Achea. Also of note is the, the kind of like ringmaster of the ceremony, a guy called um, Julian Sink, played by Colin Cunningham. I think kind of Marilyn Manson before he became even more problematic, but he's really funny in it. And uh, the series just gets more and more deranged as it goes on. It was like, do you remember like when Tarantino did his Grindhouse movie and it was just super gory and this was a sci-fi channel one, so it pushed it as hard as it could for being on the sci-fi channel. I actually bought the Blu-ray of this because I was like, this show is just not going to exist anywhere else. It was gory, it was funny, and it definitely had a great setup for a second series. Sadly, we never got it, but I'm sure Alan Mitchell doesn't mind because he's now Jack Reacher. Anyone else heard of Blood Drive? No. Nope. I heard about it, but I never followed through. <laughs> That's... No, too many jokes. Too many jokes. David, <laughs> what do you have at your joint for number 10? I have Archive 81, which again was another Netflix show about a bloke that used to restore old um, film 
he was like an archivist, hence the ar- archive. And he used to go around like looking at old film tapes and restoring them. And he got sort of intertwined into a cultist thing as he was um, reconstructing all of these these different um, video footages. And it ended on a crazy cliffhanger that we'll now never know the end of, like every other Netflix fucking cliffhanger that exists, because they're dicks. It was a fu- we 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 spoke about this on an episode really early on in the podcast, Neil, mm. if you remember. Yeah, and yeah I think um... I tried to pitch it to you and probably did an awful job. Oh, I still watched it anyway, watched David. It. You did watch no, I did. it. I watched it. I watched <gasps> it. You watched it. Yeah, yeah. I watched it. Didn't like it. The whole it thing. didn't make your top ten, Neil. What? You, what, what you, what's your problem? Because it's, it's it's fine. Yeah. Oh, burn. <laughs> <laughs> fine, burn. Yeah. No, it was good, David. I enjoyed it. And as an editor, yes, I do like the fact that it was literally about an editor assembling stuff. And it, it, bizarrely, there's that video game out, isn't it, called um, Immortality that won all the awards a couple of years ago, and it literally you could not. Design it's a video very game. Similar, yeah. Where, yeah, the, the idea with that video game is there's this actress who went missing and she did all these like bad B movies. And the game, you're basically the editor and you've got all these different little clips of scenes from the three different movies. And you have to click and zoom in on different bits of the frame to find a link to unlock the next bit. So you have no idea what the fuck's going on when you start it. And then as you unlock more clips, you start learning the story. And then if you play the clips backwards, crazy freaky shit happens as well at certain points. And you know it to play the clip back because your joypad starts rumbling. But that's not what we're here to talk about, David. So yeah, RK31. Yeah. Anymore? It's not it's not that old either. It's only like two years old, the show. It came out recently. And it couldn't have cost a lot of money because most of it was literally just one dude in editing. Yeah, and we're, yeah in a house as well. Like in one location, one actor for a lot of it. So it must have just gotten... We must have been the only people that watched it because it must have been cheap. I mean, the actor wasn't even that well known. Was it? Who was the actor that played in it? Um, we don't have time. We do have time. It was, you know what we don't? There's no chance of me being able to pronounce that name. At number nine, we have a four-way tie with four shows on the same amount of points. Uh, Jose, tell us about your one first. So this will be uh, the second and last show from ABC. It's Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23. Uh, it stars Kristen Ritter, a Dream Walker, and the James Vanderbeek. Um, and also Dawson uh, Dawson yes and for the record yes he plays an extremely funny version of himself as a celebrity in New York uh it's 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 honestly it's one of those shows that it's at first let glance again it just seems goofy and idiotic but some of their uh reoccurring jokes are just hit every time after you kind of understand the whole premise uh the the whole idea of the show is really uh the the dreamwalker is a uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed new New Yorker moving into an apartment with a Kristen Ritter who's basically uh, she hustles people and or she just is a horrible person in general but uh, over the two seasons they become friends and they actually end up liking each other and it's just it's really oh man it's just really funny I, I really I don't know how else to say just it these things that they get into just comic comic genius and James Vanderbeek he again, like the, this show was ahead of its time. It was 2012, and as a character in the show, James Vanderbeek creates gifts for himself to use online. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> Looking back into this, you're like, this was just vision envisioning the future. Like with, with it's amazing what these writers knew was going to happen. And so yeah, and it was just really funny. It was a really funny show. Do you know what though, Jose? That isn't the only time James Van Der Beek has played himself because he also played himself in Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. Silent Bob Strike Back. Oh. Yo, it's a motherfucking Dawson. <laughs> you put your dick in a pie. You wouldn't last a day on the creek. A day. <laughs> and that was it. Jay- Jason Biggs then says, fuck you and your Dawson scrap. Go to hell, Pacey. Go to hell. At least call me the right fucking character. <laughs> Perfect. Beautiful dialogue there. Beautiful dialogue. Uh, Marie, what do you have at number nine? I have, and I think this was the one main motivation for this list, is 1899, because yes. I am still fucking fuming uh, about that show being cancelled, because it was from the same people who brought you dark, uh, even some of the uh, actors, and it was just this mystery, like, thriller that took place on a boat, and you knew... I'm some... there, it's on a boat. And if in so, boat-based... Yeah. <laughs> cruise ship if Neil's joke. never told cruise you before, joke. he oh, worked yeah. on a cruise ship. 
Uh, he doesn't yeah. like to his talk about it. His favorite movie is like Speed Two Cruise Control. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, it takes place on like on a boat, and there is like something strange going on. But you don't obviously you don't know what, but you know it's something's off. And it's one of those where you really do have to pay attention and notice the details in the background. And one reason that I, one of the reasons I love this, and I think one of the reasons it did not do so well, I loved that everyone was speaking their own language. Mm -hmm. This is one of my biggest pet peeves in media, where someone is meant to be from a certain country, but they speak English. Because as someone who's like, trilingual it just drives me absolutely crazy where there's no reason they speak english and when they have an accent it just makes it more confusing like it's just so the fact that they like made the effort to have everyone speak because we have portuguese german spanish uh when the portuguese and german characters were interacting that was a bit of a headache for me because i'm trying to learn portuguese uh so and English. And it's just, and then I read that they had so many different script supervisors there to make sure that all the languages stayed consistent. And there were scenes where the characters did not understand each other because, of course, they didn't because they were, it's a realistic when you're on like a boat. Um, it's like almost like, let's say, a Titanic like setting. So everyone is coming from a different country. Everyone is, uh, 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 it makes sense. And it just, I love that aspect of it so, so much. And I appreciated the show for it so much. And yeah, and it ended up, and then it had like an amazing twist at the end. Oh, yeah. We won't give away the twist, but... We won't give away the twist because I still encourage people to check the show out. Uh, out, And it's just, it's just it's the fact it's from the people who brought us Dark, which was also phenomenal. It's just why Netflix didn't have the fate for it. Like, I was so excited for the show, like the second it was announced because I liked Dark so much. I'm amazed. Me, me and my dad watched it and we like binged the whole thing in like less than a week. And I'm amazed he stuck with it. Like, cause it is quite mind bending, but he, he loved it. Although I think he may have loved more that this is one of my favorite recurring things from the show. The end of every episode, almost, almost every episode. I'm not sure if it was everyone. It has a classic seventies rock song on it. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics of the song tie in perfectly. Like there's a bit where there's a reveal with a character and the song's called the wizard. It's black Sabbath, the wizard. And you're like, Fucking a, and again the lyrics again. It just I, you know, and they did it every episode. I was just saying, um, we were literally ticking off bands each episode. Go, it's got to be like Deep Purple. Oh fuck, it is Deep Purple. Oh, uh, Bad Company, Free, and it was all those kind of seventies classic rock bands in it. And not just the ending. The theme was fucking White Rabbit uh, from Jefferson Airplane. Jefferson Airplane. That was it. It was. It worked so well. Like it just. Oh, it worked so well in setting up the world. And then like, yeah, that ending, like because like because it was a period piece, but it ended up with mm. modern music. It was again so telling to the overall plot. It was so well done. I mean, without giving away the ending, I will say is that the twist at the end of the show would have changed the genre of the show for the second yeah. season. And I could not wait to see where that show would have gone. Exactly. I, like, I was so annoyed. That's the that's I think the thing with a cancelled show. When they set something up so amazing. And you don't get the payoff to it. And you're just like, whoa, we want to know what happens. Tell us. Tell us, you absolute bastards. Mm -hmm. And relax <laughs> as much as we can. Yeah. Well, Netflix aren't to blame for this next one. Ben, at number nine, you have. This one is one of my favourite childhood shows uh, from a kid. It was the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. It ran, what, like 92 to 93 it was exactly what it says in the tin. It was like in it, it like every episode started with uh, Indiana Jones, like the old Indiana Jones, like bump, like running into someone and like telling, basically telling him a story of like when he was a kid. And it would, he would either be like, like eight, nine, 10 years old going with his parents somewhere. Uh, and I think he had a tutor as well. Um, you know, like, uh, like I think they went like through, like through like Africa and places like that. Then like other episodes would be him as a teenager where he joins like the Belgian army underneath an assumed name uh, and fights in the world war. Uh, and like, it was a real, it was one of those like shows it, for me, it was the first instance of like crossover, like true, like the movies were so successful that like, you know, George Lucas was like, well, we could, th there's so many stories we could tell. So they had um, a guy who would play old Indiana Jones. And then for some of the episodes, 
Harrison Ford was actually in it to like bookend the seasons. Ah, okay. like it was it was really good. It was really well done. It was like like so this this kid like uh, to travel around the world um, with uh, with his with his family and like, the adventures and mischief that he would get up to as a kid. Or it was like him in the Belgian army fighting in the World War. He becomes a spy at one point, and it gives you this like background to a guy that like who essentially is an art like um, like an archaeologist who really has no place running around shooting guns like like swinging on shit with a whip. And you're being a badass. But always room for punching Nazis. Always room. Always room for punching Nazis in any, doesn't matter where you are in life, whatever time I, you're I, in. I've I just been flicking through to Wikipedia because I don't think I ever saw this back in the day. I just, really? I some, somehow it bypassed me. Bypassed me? I said that weird. Bypassed me. And uh, I'm looking at mm-hmm. some of the guest stars and people who were in this show. Cameron oh, him Jones, gone. Daniel Craig. Amazing. Christopher Lee. Clark Gregg. Thanks. Vanessa Redgrave, Elizabeth Hurley, <laughs> Anne Hesch, Jeffrey Wright, Jason Fleming, wow. Sean Pertwee, John Pertwee, Holy, Max von Sydow, Ian McDiarmid. So, like, they, uh, yeah, like I said, it was like ninety two to ninety three. They spent a huge amount of money on it. It didn't do very well in the ratings, and I don't know if it was like because they played them all out of out of sequence. Like, I don't know if that oh, was one of the things which, we're gonna, to which we're going to talk about. Yeah, we're going to talk about a show later on where that happened, um, but like. I don't know if that was the case because I definitely remember it being out of sequence in the UK. Oh. It was actually pretty clever because it was designed as like a like an educational piece. So it would you like Indiana Jones would go back and interact with a massive historical figure in some way, shape, or form that you would learn something about and then you know move on to the next adventure. But the sheer fact that they got Harrison Ford back to re- reprise Indiana Jones, which no one ever really talks about. They had yeah, a, man. yeah, they like they set. I think they set up in this one that he had a daughter and grandkids, um, which got blown out of the water by King of the Crystal Skull, which is another reason why true Indiana fans didn't 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 acknowledge that existence. Yeah. Uh, but which they, they course corrected in in the new one. They course corrected in the new one by killing him off in the like in the you know off screen. So it, it kind of almost shifted back to a place where he, you know, Indiana Jones could have a daughter and then she could have grandkids and stuff. So like it, it was great. And yeah. It was, it was bigger than the, the the budget they spent on it. It was it was a bigger idea. It was like George Lucas bringing his like movie ideas to the small screen. I just don't think it 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 held up. Do you, do you know? I think the problem with it was Ben. People didn't want to learn about history. People 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 hated education. It was the nineties, man. We were looking forward, not back. Now a show that. Another show that ended on a cliffhanger, almost a literal cliffhanger. David, what do you have at number nine? I've got the NBC show about the infamous Hannibal Lecter called, aptly named Hannibal. Uh, and it's starring uh, Mads Mikkelsen as the man himself. And it also had uh, Hugh Dancy in it as Will Graham. And it was about Will Graham as the um, the de- FBI detective. And he Hannibal Lecter gets on it like assigned to him as his psychiatrist, and it's essentially like Silence of the Lambs, except Hannibal Lecter's not, you know, incarcerated. He's not in prison at this point. He's out and about, and he's helping out uh, the FBI and trying to influence them from within. It is uh, one of the best. I, mean, I think this is the best TV show on my list because some of the, as in. Yeah, yeah, I'd say this is probably the best TV show on my list, anyway. Like, because take personal enjoyment out of it, which is why others are ranked higher than it. Nice. I think, yeah. um, I think some of the death scenes in it, where all the, where, you know, the FBI are investigating the murder scene, some of the set pieces, like sets that were were done and drawn up for that were just harrowing. Uh, And then just shots of Mads Mikkelsen, who deserved all the awards, Neil, to use your language. Um, for, for his betrayal as Hannibal, he um, just him eating, man, just him just having like his steak dinner and his cooking, like all the shots of him cooking, just just in between takes and like in, in between scenes, sorry, and his like sitting there eating. And he has all these dinner parties, and um, it was it was such a good show. And, and some of the cast, mate, I remember Gillian like, Anderson coming into it. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I. Uh, it, uh, who else is in it? There was um, oh yeah, Florence Fishburne, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was also amazing. Yeah, 
Well, it was... what was clever? What was clever with the show is they started working through the actual books, didn't they? So they kind of did the Red Dragon stuff. Is it Red Dragon where you got? I've not read the books, so I've, I have no idea about the books. It was this weird, really creepy show. I remember some some of the critics at the time didn't like it. When I say critics, I don't mean actual critics. I mean just the average people who watched it were like, "But it's so slow. Nothing's happened." Literally, there was a two minute sequence once of a snail on a bit of on a bit of grass or something, and everyone's like, "What the fuck is going on here?" But I don't know. I, I do remember getting frustrated watching it, but then sticking with it because it was so good. And I was like, I'm going to accept whatever the hell they're trying to do here because I want to get to the They weren't stuff. afraid to make like bold decisions as well oh, by no. killing off like killing off like main characters that were or like the, you know, the finales of some of the seasons where one of the main characters gets killed and then how she gets killed and then how she's presented as well after that. And this like because if you don't just get killed in that show. If, if, if Hannibal kills you or the serial killers, the other serial killers that they were trying to punt down kill you he's going to present you in some sort of i remember a few of them were like angelic sort of scenarios where the guts are hanging out everywhere and there was one like there's a famous art piece where they split a cow in half i don't know if you guys have seen that where like the damien cow hurst. Is, like split with um who's that sorry damien hurst yes damien yeah hurst. They, so that yeah. They, they do that but with a person they split split a person like that with and uh it's um yeah, some yeah, some of the deaths in it and how they're presented for, for them to solve. Well, yeah, it was such a good show. It was cancelled on an actual cliffhanger. But mm-hmm. you're like, literally, just gonna be like, this char- are these characters alive or dead? We do we'll not never know. know. We'll never know. We'll never know. However, uh, they've kept hinting at like doing a fourth season, or apparently Brian Fuller because it's Brian Fuller of uh, Pushing Daisies, and did he do the original hero? I think he did the original heroes as well, Brian Fuller fame yeah. he did this show and he's been working for years now to try and get the rights to the silence of the lambs so he can actually make silence of the lambs but with mickelson playing lector oh wow and i kind of want to see it i, kind of, I like as, you know, as, great, as great as this is i do think i think if you've watched this show nine out of ten people who watch your show will go matt mickelson is better than anthony hopkins wow bold statement what do you think david i mean it's the it depends on what film you watch. If you just watch Silence of the Lambs, no. But if you watch the other ones that aren't as good? Yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> then potentially it's up there, yeah. But if obviously Silence of the Lambs sticks there. It's its own. Okay, well, moving on to number eight, we have a three-way tie with Marie, Jose and Ben's picks all on the same amount of points. Marie, what do you have at number eight? Oddly, fittingly enough, Sense8. So... Hey. I- yeah. Um, so was it cancelled because it was gay? I mean, yeah. Well, it, yeah, it was very gay. But I think what the <laughs> reason for this is that um, the budget, because Sense8 was a show, and this was early, early Netflix. Like this was when Netflix was quite empty. Like this was one of their like very first original series. Is it and, that old? Sense8? Yeah, twenty fifteen. Being that old. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was um, like. Um, it was pretty. Uh, it was like made by the Wachowskis, um, and oh. the story goes that it's eight people who are basically almost have like a psychic link between them and are connected from all over the world. And basically, they're the next evolution of humans. Uh, humans, and similar to like X Men, that's why everyone hates them and wants to hunt them down. But the way like this works is basically the characters interact with each other in their own environments and these characters were like all over the world so we had like uh so that meant like they had to do fly basically they had to fly the entire cast around the world just to shoot a few couple of scenes and it just got very very expensive but i generally loved the premise of this um i am like when someone like i love stories when people are like psychically linked i love that concept uh, except like the Aes Sedai and the waters in the wheel of time or like uh like there's another book called the ray bearer which is like similar to like sense eight but young adult and far like sense eight has a lot of orgies i think as well so, oh, yeah. it's uh, and jose's woken up <laughs> on brand maybe that's why it didn't gel with the like a lot of people there there, there 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 is yeah i love different depictions of love and different 
different versions of relationships and platonic, polyamorous. Like I do really like those. I really like seeing those in media. And um, it just, yeah, it just had such an interesting concept. And it was canceled, unfortunately. They did get enough of a um, heads up that it was going to be canceled so they could actually conclude the story. But in my opinion, the way they concluded the story, it was extremely rushed. They didn't answer quite a lot of the questions that they set up. It literally ended with a bang. It ended with an orgy. And the <laughs> like, <laughs> it's uh, very classic to the show. But also like how the main conflict was resolved was also quite quick uh, without giving away spoilers, in my, in my opinion. I really did... Like, I thought there, the show had so much potential and I thought they could have explored it a lot more. And that's what sad is. The birth sequence could have been left out. I'm still very <laughs> traumatized by that. Um, if people have seen the show, they know what I'm on about. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, I thought it, like, it had a great cast, a solid premise. The only downside was the budget was just huge. Was there a plan for more seasons then? They they had a, a definitive end point for it, did they, where the story was going? Or I'm not sure, but I definitely thought they wanted more seasons out of it um, because the ending was extremely rushed and there was like a lot of questions they did not answer. Uh, answer. So I'm like, I, like... I'm really I like I think they did have like a proper conclusion in mind. They just had to rush it, which is really sad. Um, because I think they got to the conclusion that they wanted to, but the, the it was missing some things in between. They had to jump there a bit quicker than they wanted to be to get there. Yeah. Right. Um, Jose, you've got a show next which stars an actor I love that I've never seen and only briefly heard of. How has this happened? Well, the show was aired from 93 to 94. So it's probably why. It's probably <laughs> we, why probably, Ameri- we probably never got it in the UK either, I don't it, think. It's, it's very American. It's uh, the show of The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. And the actor you're talking about is Bruce Campbell. Yeah, Bruce! Uh, it's about a bounty hunter looking for a set of criminals that killed his father collectively. Uh, the, 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 the pilot was basically his father had rounded them all up. He was taking them to jail. And they were all in one big cabin. And then they all escaped and killed his father, basically going for revenge as a bounty hunter. Because he was uh, apparently a very well-educated bounty hunter. Harvard-educated lawyer who decided he wanted to change his career to hunt down these uh, bandits. I'm looking yeah, I'm looking at a synopsis myself. And it says, um, basically, it was a Western. However, it included elements of sci-fi and steampunk. A little How bit have of... I heard of this show? It's more sci-fi than steampunk. Uh, it just had an inventor who was able to create things in a country western style. Um, but it, it, yes, it was hilarious. It was a, it was a, another comedy. Um, it, it, it lasted about twenty-seven episodes, I believe. And so it went through a phase when I did some research again on this show. Uh, they they realized it was one of those things where you were filming and and writing the show as the season went on. So about halfway through, they decided to cut out the sci-fi aspect of it and it became more of a traditional western and is that why it got cancelled i don't know it it, i enjoyed it i think the sci-fi aspect really drew me in as as it being more than just a western well jose at the end of the 27 episodes did it have a definitive ending or was it just cancelled when they had more to go that's the thing i don't remember i don't remember (gasps) the ending of the show i just think it, it ran its season and then they just never really uh renewed it because I mean, that's, head, I th- that's being called cancelled. Yeah, well, no, but I'm saying I don't think it ended on a on a cliffhanger, so I don't know if they knew they were. But going you didn't watch to... it, so you don't know. Oh, I did watch it. I I remember you watching did? it. Plot twist. It, I did watch it. I watched <laughs> it enough to where I thought it was two different seasons because of the fact that they kind of got away from the sci-fi and, and they did 27 episodes in one season. 27. That's a lot. Yeah, that kind of tells you back then there was just a whole different world. All right, so uh, number eight. This is one of my, one of the cancellations which which irked me horrendously when uh, when they got cancelled. Yeah, cream for that. Uh, it's a show called Flash. Shut your face. 
Uh, there's uh, a show called Flash Forward. It was uh, basically the show in a nutshell was um, a, a phenomenon happens around the world. You're seeing it from the, uh, the point of view of the residents of Los Angeles. Uh, I'm just going to read the synopsis there as they go about their daily uh, duties, unaware that a mysterious about is about to change their lives. FBI agent Mark Benford, uh, played by Joseph Fiennes, uh, and Dimitri No, um, who is played by John Cho. John Cho. Um, so, John Cho, like a couple of couple of heavy hitters there straight away, um, uh, are in a car chase. Uh, Benford's physician wife in the middle of surgery. Benford's friend, Aaron Stark, works on power lines above high ground. Suddenly, something causes everybody in the world to black out for just over two minutes. Everybody in the world. And during that time, each person has a dream and sees a series of events in their own future. Some good, some bad, some apparently non-existent. Uh, as people begin to piece together their visions on a worldwide website, Mark and Dimitri use the information to try and pinpoint the cause of the blackout um, as they are FBI um investigators um and other and then people start to try and like like if it's bad they try and change that if it's good they try and drive forwards to that if they didn't have a dream the theory is that you were dead before this point in the time and you find out that everybody saw the same point in time as well the reason that this really pissed me off when it got cancelled is because you start to get a sense you, you're getting towards the day that everybody saw right everybody saw the same day and as you get towards that day you see people's fates happening the way that they're gonna that, that they saw in their dreams and it doesn't seem like anything they can do can change it and then something happens and maybe someone does change it but then a second like just as you figure out that people are starting to get a hand on this thing another blackout happens everybody passes out again and that's the end of the last episode bastard oh my god so it was like everyone's getting a hand on it the day comes everything happens like the way it was like it was panned out and then everyone blacks out again so it was like what the, it was genius because it the, the the flash forwards it sets up the next season and then you didn't get to see it this is my favorite pitched concept so far for the for a, for a show i've not seen really <laughs> this is the one that's got me at the moment yeah it's yeah, so good then sold me when it came out in um 2009 everyone was calling it the new lost yeah i also had dominic monaghan in it as well from lost jack davenport was in it as well but it was written in and created by brannon bragger and david s goya who star trek guys weren't they mm -hmm. So yep. it had that kind of thing to it. Bizarre as well, the compose the music in it was Ramin Djawadi right back before his Game of Thrones days as well. So I've mm. learned that now. If you yeah. flash forwarded and if you were dead, what did you, you just see nothing? Did you yes, see nothing? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'd have been on the toilet or something like that. But it took people <laughs> ages to figure that out as well. It was like it was really well paced. It was like it was really well put together. It was a fucking banging show. It was like there was enough action in it to to keep like the like the adrenaline junkies in. And it was smart enough to keep like the cerebral people in there oh, invested. And speaking of pace, we need to pick up the pace here and move on to number seven, where we have a five-way tie. So we're going to have to run through this very quickly. <laughs> and all five of us have got different shows for this. So I have a show called Carnival or Carnivali because it had oh, an E I on love the that end. Show. Oh, uh, so yeah. it was created by a guy called Daniel Nelf, and it was a weird, weird show that I couldn't stop watching. It was a dark period fantasy drama about the lives of a traveling carnival in America's Dust Bowl during the Great Depression. There were struggles between good and evil and a mythology that drew from Christianity, the Masons, and even the Knights Templar. The star of all people was Nick Stahl. Do you remember him from Terminator 3? Mm -hmm. The kid from Terminator 3? That was oh, him. Yeah. He played a guy called Ben Hawkins, a young man who has healing powers. And of course, I remember the opening episode. He's like he finds a, little, a a bird dying in a field, and he goes and touches the bird, and the bird comes alive, and then everything else in the field dies. So oh. it, it already sets up this awesome. He can heal, but it takes something away from somewhere else. So that was really cool. And he joins the carnival when it passes through his town. The other plot, because that was like your main A plot, then your B plot of the show, was this um, Methodist preacher called Brother Justin, played by the brilliant Clancy Brown, Kurgan from Highlander. And they both begin to share the same kind of dreams about this battle in the future between good and evil and how they both think they're on the right side of it. So that was what was good about uh, 
Brown's character, he thought he was doing like the godly thing, and you're watching him going, no, he's an absolute evil priest bastard. Um, <laughs> but the slow burning plot puts them on a collision course. The show also had Amy Madigan, Carla Gallo, Michael J. Anderson from Twin Peaks, Cleo Duval amongst the ever expanding cast, and uh, it had brilliant viewing figures in the first season. I think it was a HBO show as well, if I remember rightly. And it had great reviews again in the second season, but it, the viewers just weren't there in the second season, and it's frustrating because Nell said he'd planned out the show for six seasons, of which we only got two. It's an awesome show. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out. I don't know where it is now, but yeah, it was originally HBO. Uh, Jose, you have a show called Almost Human. Yes, uh, 2013. <laughs> Damn, Neil. I, I, you will be surprised how short this was going to be. That's what uh, she said. Oh. Ah, that... <laughs> How old Almost are we? human. 13. <laughs> Definitely, we haven't matured past that. Uh, Almost Human 2013 from Fox again. Uh, this is actually Dude. my number three show. Uh, Carl Urban. Young yeah. Carl Urban uh, plays a cop in the future. It's He's injured. He comes back. He gets set up with What's, it? Robot? What's that word? Robot partner? Simf Simf partner. partner. Their partner. He gets seven up with a partner who's an android played by Michael Ely. Um, there's a lot of other characters. Mackenzie Crook, Minka Kelly's involved. Uh, basically, it, they solve crimes. And uh, to wrap it all up very shortly, it's a mix of Will Smith's iRobot, a buddy cop duo, and more recently, the creator. Because there's a lot of, you know, hey, what's sentience and what is not? And there's a lot of, you know, it was a really good show, and um, I think it had a lot of potential. I just think that it was ahead of its time, and people weren't ready to deal with androids having freedom, you know? Bastards. And, and also Rise of the Machines! Of... Rise of the Machines! <laughs> okay, all right. So, yeah, that's it. I, I feel like that's the, the quickest way I could describe it. It was a great show. I loved it. I agree with Jose. It was a great show. Same. I agree. Carl Urban should be in more stuff all the time. Uh, Judge Dredd, part two. Yes, give us Judge Dredd too, you utter bastards. Uh, ben, I love this show you've talked about. No one else has brought it up, but it's an amazing show. And that show is. Yeah. It's called Year of the Rabbit. It's uh, Matt Berry's, uh, like, it was his latest project after he's done Toast of London and Toast of New York and stuff like that. Uh, it's basically set in Victorian London. Detective Inspector Rabbit, portrayed by Matt Berry, teams up with his hapless by the books partner, Strauss who was played by Freddie Fox, who you might know from Slow Horses. Spider. Um, he plays he play Spider in Slow Horses, exactly. This is an out-and-out -out comedy. It's fucking ridiculous. Uh, Spectre Rabbit is a hardened booze hound. He's seen it all. Rabbit's been chasing bad guys for as long as he can remember. But these days, his heart keeps stopping at inopportune moments. And he, and he like, sums it up by saying... Mm my jam tart stopped you got to punch me in the chest it's fucking weird it also one of his confidants one of his uh, one of his go to guys is the elephant man now like none of this is like none of this is in any way shape or form supposed to be like you know accurate apart from the fact that it's like set in victorian london like one um one of the episodes they're chasing a guy called the brick man who uh, kills people and leaves brick dust behind um like and it's it's fucking it's weird my the, the, I I never I have never laughed so hard as I have watching this show. The opening of the first episode is genius. He's interrogating a suspect, and he's like, "Where did you Where did you stash the girl? Where did you stash?" This guy's crying. He's like, "Oh my god, I don't know." Like you know, and, you know, rabbits like wailing on him, and the the guy breaks. He's like, "Oh, I'm sorry. I'll tell you anything. I need anything you want to know." And then the tone shifts. Rabbit stands up, and and it is actually uh, talking to a class full of kids. It says, and that is how we break a suspect. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it goes from there into fucking utter ridiculousness. It is one of the funniest, most ridiculous shows. I was so excited for a second season. If they'd have just given me two seasons, it would have been great because it was only six episodes. So, oh, wow. yeah, Matt, Matt Berry being peak Matt Berry, absolutely ridiculous. There's just a guy in the police station whose who, catchphrase, completely out of context, would just go, yeah, it's time to shit or get off the pot. And it made no sense. It made no <laughs> sense to what was going on in the episode. It was it was just pure genius. Oh, what I liked is as well, it was building, like, it was really funny every episode. But then he had Keely Hawes came into it as kind of like this rich Victorian woman, maybe villain, uh -huh. as it kind of went on. Yep. And there was such good setup with her. Because I remember they set all these threads up for the next series. And then, of course, no next series. Bastards. Next series. 
Bastards, bastards, yep. bastards. Well, David, your show, I think, I is don't... the only one that we can disqualify. Does yes, it count? Had eight seasons. No, it doesn't count. Yeah, seasons, but it was still cancelled. If you Google it, it says it was cancelled. After They just decided seasons, they just didn't want to do it anymore. Seasons, I think. Wasn't it? Yeah, but it didn't run for nine it, or it ten, Neil. Did it run for seasons. ten seasons, Neil? Most shows do not need to run for ten seasons. Eight seasons. Brooklyn Nine-Nine. It could have done a Friends. Seasons. You know, Love it could have gone, it it gone the whole ten. And see, but, Jose's with me. Jose wants more Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Nine-Nine. One of the Nine-Nine. many amazing Michael Shaw shows. Oh, yeah. it's I, I. It was one of the best sitcoms of its time. It still is. It's one up there with one of the best sitcoms. But it ran for seven great seasons. But and was then... it cancelled or not, Neil? That's the question. Yes, David, because they, they but they didn't want there to do it There you go. Anymore. So it's not, on my not, list. Not ABC not want to do it. They didn't want to do it anymore because COVID meant half the people couldn't be on the set for the final series. Scully oh. and Hitchcock were not there. They were just on iPads the whole season. And it was shot in the peak of COVID. And you're just like, it's just people in the rooms. And it's you could, you could just tell it didn't work. There wasn't that same energy that the previous seasons had. And also... Half the there world's was a lot... dying. Well, exactly. Half the world's dying. And also, there was a lot of a lot of police brutality going on in America at that time. You know, more yeah. so than usual. And I remember Andy Samberg doing an interview going, it's, we don't really want to make a comedy about everyone liking cops at the minute. We'd like rather just, you know, hold our hands up and walk away. And, you know, that's why it got cancelled, David. I feel they I, decided no, to cancel it. I feel they yes. handled it pretty well because the role's no. a character. I think uh, it's it just got... as well as it could have been. As well as it could have been. I just don't think they, I think they should have ended it at seven because it, it didn't Rosa. work because of COVID and it was a little bit preachy in the last season. And it had to be, and it had to be a bit more Rosa serious. Rosa is Mirabelle in Encanto, which yeah. is also <laughs> a good film. Wow. There what a go. way to shift that conversation. <laughs> well, we're going to shift it once more because we're going to shift it to a show, Marie's show at number seven, that I have never heard of. Yeah. And yeah. I think only maybe David has heard of this one. Have I? Yeah. I haven't checked the list. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, so um, this show, and I think it might be the only animated one on our list. So this is called oh. The Owl House, and it was put out by Disney, and it is a beautiful, whimsical show where a human falls through a portal and finds herself in a world called The Boiling Isles, which is like this fairy tale with a horror twist. A fairy tale world with a horror twist. And so the world was really interesting. The characters were so, so lovable. The animation was fucking incredible. And it was just incredible and also extremely gay. And it got canceled after two seasons. And I think this was one of those cases that Ben was mentioning earlier where Disney got actually a new CEO and then they decided to cancel the show. I'm not 100% sure that's true, but I remember reading something along those lines. lines. Um, They did get a final season, which they, after the fan up outrage outrage they gave us like three episodes to actually conclude the story which was um which they were really amazing but they could have ran for so much long and it's just if you like gravity falls you will like the owl house it's like in that vein of humor and whimsy and it's just so beautiful and so much fun and i really really love this show wow because you're 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 you was you was our regular disney guy david uh i hadn't heard of it I'm going to watch it. Good. Watch there it. You watch it. You will it. love it. <laughs> right. So moving on to number six. And we only, ha- thankfully, we only have a three-way tie this time. Don't worry. As we get higher up, we are literally just one show for a lot more numbers coming up soon. And the first one I'm going to mention is The OA. Created and produced by Zell Batman and star of the show Britt Marling. The OA was a deeply strange yet hypnotic mystery drama sci-fi show that was cancelled after only two seasons in a planned five-season arc. And honestly, the twist at the end of the second season is an all-timer. I will not ruin that here because the creators are still trying to find a way to get the show off Netflix and finish it themselves. Um, but of all the shows on this list that didn't get a chance to end the story, for me, the OA is the most egregious because it does something so... It's along the lines of 1899 in that... It does a twist that it's going to change the genre of the show for the upcoming season that we never got. But even before that twist at the end of the second series, as Stefan from Saturday Night Live would say, this show has everything. It's got a psychic octopus called Old Night. It's got a title card for the show that comes up over 70 minutes into the pilot episode. 
It has uh, dimension hopping. It's got time travel. It's got an evil Jason Isaacs. Honestly, it's a show that is so well crafted and self assured that for the most of the first season, I was every episode. You're thinking, "What the fuck is going on?" But also, why can't I stop watching? <laughs> it's like it, there's just something magnetic about it. I mean, people do like these kind of like Tai Chi movements and start humming, and then that lets them travel to different universes. It's absolutely crazy. You've got actors playing different alternate versions of themselves. It's just an insane show. And uh, yeah, like I say, it's got such a next level twist that we were robbed off. Uh, did anyone here quickly watch the OA? Did not. I saw the first episode and I was bored. <laughs> Jose, you're banished. Banished to the Phantom Zone in a spin dish. <laughs> I was like, where is this going? I think I watched maybe two, honestly. I was just like, I know this is apparently going to go somewhere because uh, people told me to watch it. Like, Because I think I watched it a year or two after it came out. And I was just like, I don't, I don't see what the hype is, honestly. I mean, I knew there was a mystery to it, but it just didn't get it. <gasps> okay, st- still banned to the Phantom Zone. David, <laughs> another, another potential disqualification coming up for you here. Well, no, why? Why are you disqualifying all the... Why can't you let me have nice things? <laughs> why, don't you you nice things? Things? why don't you understand what cancellation means? Heroes. Yeah. Why don't you understand the rules of the podcast? Heroes <laughs> was cancelled, Neil. It was cancelled because it was terrible. Okay? Yes. And it was terrible because there was a writer's strike in season two and it was it was just awful after that but if yeah. the cancellation is justified like Marie, are... i hope you're on my side here okay <laughs> i don't want to okay i'm i'm not i'm just asking because like the whole point is egregious cancellations egregious and if this yeah no so i i want justice for heroes okay heroes was a fucking amazing tv show in season one it was season so was good in season one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then there was the writer's strike, and then it just became utter dog shit. It was basically cancelled after season Where, one. Whatever okay? happened That's to what Peter Petrelli's girlfriend in the, after in the season future? One. No one yeah. knows. She's still no there. Who, yeah, whatever. You, nobody it's like, knows, but, it's like in, De- it's like in Deadpool, why, why is Thor crying? Yeah. <laughs> why is Thor like, crying? Similar to Ben in the other show we mentioned earlier, I had a massive crush on Hayden Penetier. And mm. she started dating Vladimir Klitschko, so that was a little intimidating for me. But she's not anymore. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, she's still available. I mean, you're also married with a child now. I was so. about to I'm, say that. I can make it work, Jose. Um, Is she on your laminated list? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yep, yep, that makes she, sense. She your whole pass. Oh, yeah, buddy. Mm. She's, she's yeah, there. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but David, David, yeah. the point being is, as I round this off with a firm fist, an iron fist, if you will, it well, had, apparently not. The, the reboot, no. the reboot doesn't count either, just because it was bloody awful. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't. No, you, you don't. The, the issue it has is it was that this happened after Marvel, and now every second TV show seems to have a superhero twist. So now this show is left like just way, like way behind on what other TV shows are doing with superhero writing, and even like the effects and like just just the production value of it isn't there. So when you bring a TV show back, you need to, it 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 just needed to be. I'm just sad that it never got to be what it could have been, which is one of the it, best TV shows ever. I've got to, I've wasn't. got to agree. I've got to agree. Season one, save the cheerleaders, save the world was the the phrase oh. of, of, of the year. Season it cancelled itself, man. Like it fucked yeah, itself over it so did. hard. Like it like it, I don't think this counts in in the conversation that we're talking about right now. But I am a hundred percent with you. I wanted seasons two, three, four, and five to be like as good as season one and for them to take it and run with it. But they didn't. They fucked themselves. They cancelled themselves. It doesn't count in this list, but it is egregious. It's egregious. Thank you, Ben. But also the recap. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 let's leave no. it there. You don't no. no, you don't need to you don't need to. And well, actually, I'm gonna argue with Ben on this next one anyway. Because <laughs> this is a a show that actually has delivered on all the seasons it was about to it promised and that show is probably my second favorite sitcom of all time or sometimes joint top and that is community then six seasons in the movie six seasons in the movie Uh, i've got to defend myself as to as as to why it was cancelled like one more i wanted one more season out of community i wanted one more season it went through fucking all sorts of fucking hell I, like I wanted them to end on something fucking brilliant and magical and incredible. Uh, maybe we get the movie, maybe we don't. I wanted one more season just to round it all out. I wanted like I don't know. I wanted Jeff Winger to become the dean. I wanted you know like just 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 ridiculousness. 
and but also in the in the way that it was written, like Dan Harmon's like perfectly mangled mind. I, I just wanted another season. I'm selfish. Fuck you. I mean, Abed. Even Abed said six seasons in a movie. He did. Who are you to argue with t- Abed? Could have been a TV movie. Well, that's what we're getting. <laughs> Let me just say, yeah. Jim Rash point. was an uh, amazing side character. As Oscar-winning a... Jim Rash. Jim mm. Rash. Yeah, he wrote like, the Descendants. I think w- one of my favorite moments was when he was dressed up and he started rapping. Rapping, yeah. Uh, the rapping peanut bar. Like, oh my god, I don't know what I went into. <laughs> It was just like <laughs> so Obama is scared of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just he added so much to that show. Don't you like we say Neil, would you say that like uh more community would be a bad thing? Never. Mm-mm. There you go then. Then then I don't need to defend myself. You just agreed with me. Move on to the next thing. Okay, and that brings us up to number five. Number five, where we have a tie with three shows, but Two of these shows are two of the people's number one shows. And we're not going to do those first. We we're going to do. We need a new system for making points. This is very Yeah, complicated. The, the maths are not <laughs> mathing. <laughs> right. I'm going to mention the show at number five that had quite a few points. And that show is Lockwood and Co., a show we briefly mentioned earlier. Had a massive fan base. It was cancelled. And it was a young adult horror drama starring Ruby Stokes, Cameron Chapman, and Ali Hajimi. Ali Hajj Hashmati as Lucy Carlyle, Anthony Lockwood, and George Karim. And the premise was, in a future alternate version in present-day Britain, ghosts are deadly to the touch, and have been rising from their graves for 50 years because of this phenomenon known as the problem. Technical advances, technical advances have stopped. For example, there's no internet and people still use cassette recorders. Adults cannot see the ghosts, but children can, so teenagers have been organised into licensed ghost hunting agencies to detect and dispose of threats. Lucy Carlyle is a gifted teenager. She runs away from home, comes to London, and hopes of catching work at an agency, running out of options. She applies for a job at a tiny outfit run by two boys in an old townhouse, Lockwood & Co. Now, this was such a fun show. It was based oh, on a God. series of books by Jonathan Stroud. So they had the material, and they committed the cardinal sin of ending the show on a cliffhanger, because all season we've been hinted that Lockwood was finally going to reveal what was in this locked room. Uh, the young cast were all superb. And shout out, justice for Lily Newmark, Norrie, Lucy's best friend who ends up in a coma in the first episode, who never wakes up. And you just like, if you cast her, she's probably going to come back, this actress. Um, she's also in Sex Education, got written out of that for the fourth season, just disappeared. And uh, her character was also in, very memorably, for one scene of The Free Body Problem and gets mushed by a truck. So I was just like, <laughs> if the show had come back, at least she would have got to actually finish a role for once. Um, but Lockwood & Co, so well done, is actually scary as well and a great gateway horror for younger audiences. And the central, the central trio all killed it with their performances. So, of course, Netflix cancelled it. Also, I think I said at the time, Cameron Chapman is a good shout for oh, 10 yeah. years down the line to be Bruce Wayne when you need a new Batman again. Oh, Interesting. Yeah, give okay. them 10 years when they need that thing or if they need a younger looking Bruce Wayne, he's your guy. I mean, I think we have enough Batman, but true. But like... One thing, like another thing that this show did was it encouraged me to read the books. So I actually do know what's behind that door. Um, And the books are so, so, so good. And now and then I read the books and I rewatched the show and they did such a loyal adaptation. Like book two, they took some liberties, but I did understand it. Not someone like, oh, they ruined the whole series. Um, no, uh, they um, did like they did some uh, creative changes, um, but I like they adapted book one like extremely loyal because season one was book one and book two, and it's so annoying because there are only six books, so they could have told the story in three seasons, and they just canceled it as it did. So I highly recommend checking out the books. And if you also want to like talk about justice, Ruby Stokes, who played Lucy, she was actually the original Francesca in Bridgerton. And she left because of Lockwood and Co. Oh. Yeah. And if they recast her now. They've recast mm-hmm. her and she was the mm-hmm. main character. She was one of the main characters she's, in yeah, season she's the main three. Character of this one, yeah. Uh, uh, season three and we'll probably get her own story in season five i think uh so yeah uh it makes it worse because she went on to do a um there was a paramount plus streaming show called the burning girls which was samantha morton it was like this horror kind of like folky horror show and it's only because friend of the show charlie gallagher he's friends with the author of that book and then we watched the show and it wasn't very good she was great in it samantha morton was great in it and that's one of these shows that was cancelled 
I mean, it was only one book, one season anyway, but it's one that's just been wiped off the service again. It's like nowhere. The show doesn't exist. I know. Justice for Ruby Stokes. You who makes now, sense sp- <laughs> speaking of Justice, Marie, this is your number one show. Gentlemen, prepare yourselves. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, this is an egregious insult that this ended up on number five on our list. I mean... <laughs> Who else here, though, has actually seen the show first, bar me and Marie? Need to hear the show first, Neil. How fucking dare you? It's... <laughs> <laughs> it's Our Flag Means Death. I want my gay pirates back. So this show... Marie, I have, to, I have a feeling that the algorithm is just giving you more <laughs> of what you want, not <laughs> just throwing random stuff your way. No. So, yeah, there's a certain theme to my list. Anyway, <laughs> so this... um. It's not the algorithm, it's my life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this show, it was by Taiga Watiti and Reese Darby. And when, when this was announced that these two were involved, I was already excited because I really do enjoy Taiga's work. And I love Reese Darby from Fly of the Concords and The Boat That Rocked. And I think he's an incredible actor and you don't see him that often. And the story goes that uh, Reese Darby is a pompous aristocrat who gives up his life of wealth to pick up pirating and he is a very very terrible pirate and Taiga Watiti plays Blackbeard and it is just such a fun show the ensemble cast is brilliant uh brilliant there's just so many great lines and what's more annoying that I personally found season two better than season one I oh, thought wow. season two ro- arose to a new level. It was so funny. The Calypso episode was, oh my God, so, so good. And yeah, they canceled it. Uh, and, and HBO canceled it. And there was a petition going on. We had a billboard in Times Square. Someone literally like had a truck that like s- s- like flashed save our flag means death outside of the HBO offices. Wow. Then um, there was, I think, a... Um, uh, a billboard in Piccadilly Circus or something because they really wanted the BBC to pick them up. So because then the campaign went to the UK. So the fan effort was there, but unfortunately no one wanted to pick up the show, which is such a missed opportunity. And um, I think it didn't help that also season two, I think aired during the writer's strike. So they couldn't even promote it. Like, uh, like, and just seeing all these characters, uh, like seeing all these actors talk about the show, like there's so, so much love there. And yeah, it's just such a good, funny show. Check it out. <laughs> it's got Hoda. It's got Hoda from Game of Thrones in it. Yes. Gay pirate. What more do you need? Yep. I, I have actually like, seen the first like three, <clears throat> three or four episodes of the show. And so it, you're the plain Daisy. The, I well, I'm one of the reasons. Yeah, I didn't vibe with it. If I'm honest, I'm sorry. I saw Marie. the first season. I thought it was fantastic. I didn't watch the second season because I knew it got cancelled. So I was like, I didn't want to disappoint myself by watching the second Aww. season, getting to getting to the end of it and being bummed out. You know, but that's another thing. The second season didn't come on BBC. Like season one was on BBC, but season <clears> two <throat> did never came on BBC nor Disney Plus. So and it was like yeah. a year's so I, wait. Yeah, well for it to yeah. come over here. Yeah, but it was like it was genius because it was like it like. It, it scared a lot of people because it is very queer. But I think, like, I think it like like pirates and uh, and, uh, and like mash historically like, queer. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, there's it was, evidence but there. It was, it, for me, for me, it was like it it rang true of like hot fuzz where yeah. they were they're writing the story and then halfway through writing the story they're like, oh, actually, the story, the love story is between the two guys. It's between mm-hmm. like you know Nick Frost and Simon Pegg. And then, so like, I was, I had flashbacks to that, and Puff was one of my favorite movies of all time. And like, watching this show and just like seeing like the development of Restarby's character and like, and what, how you learn about him. And like, he's like, like the, the whole story is him running away from his married life to like hang out with guys on a boat. Like, it's fucking, like, even just that as a synopsis, I'm like, I'm in, I'm going to watch the shit out of this. It's fucking great. But honestly, I couldn't bring myself to watch the second season because I knew it was cancelled and I was gutted. And I, I, I'm I, kind of saving it. I'm like, I'm going to watch it at some point and I'm going to be bummed out when I get to the end of it because it's fucking brilliant. It does kind of end on like a kind of sort of conclusion, but uh, they could have given us more seasons. And I wanted a Fly the Concords ca- cameo. Like they, yeah. they needed oh, yeah. a Fly the Concords ca- cameo. As I was just mentioned, as we briefly mentioned earlier, Taka's most recent show, 
uh, time balance has just been cancelled as well. And Taka was in that playing the Supreme Being, and Jermaine mm. Clement was in it playing pure evil. And I was like, come on, season two, you have to get Murray in it, and you also have to get uh, Brett in it. And now that's not going to happen because they've cancelled that as well. You utter bastards. Is Waititi on a bit of like a downed. No. Like a down. I just think slope, it's think? public like, opinion of him. I honestly <laughs> think it's public opinion. Nick Skull wins. Great little film. Yeah. Back to like mm. doing what he does. I think I think the only thing that he really can take crap for is his acting in some films, where he's coming in a bit part role and people don't like him because of him coming in playing that kind of role. But his own content, his own shows. No, there hasn't been a thing. For Love and Thunder is the one thing that a lot of people hate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even I didn't hate Look. it. I just didn't think it was any good. Problem is, I think Ragnarok is so good. Yeah, and he, yeah, you know, the one two of Ragnarok and Jojo Rabbit back to back. You know, Jojo you know, Rabbit literally is won an Oscar epic. for it. Yeah, it's incredible. And then suddenly, I think the media just got tired of him being everywhere and started shitting on him basically. And his content, yeah, I mean, his stuff's just as good, man. His um his content with Rita or with with Ita, with Rita Ora is like is sort of like everywhere. So there's like there's a lot of there's a lot of Taika Waititi around it in the world right yeah. now. And I think, yeah, it's, it's creating a bit of a... Like, a bit of a with, uh... he's, getting a, he's getting a bit of a backlash, isn't he? For just being himself, mm, really. A little bit. I'll which be is honest, bizarre, think... because, that's, which, because that's what everyone loved about him in the first place. Also, there's so yeah. many more more worse people in Hollywood. That's what I do right. yeah. understand. <laughs> I would just yeah. say, love, Thor, love, and Thor was not as good as... Oh. <laughs> you stopped me in my she tracks. She said there was many more people, were many worse people in, in Hollywood. I just had a cough. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, Thor Love and Thunder is probably the only one that I really just did not like. I, and it seemed like he just phoned that one in, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, it could have been better. But yeah, I mean, Taika Waititi TV does put out really great stuff. Yeah. Right. And David, your number one show, which is uh, our joint number Again, five. Again, I'm sad that you guys didn't put it even anywhere near your list. Has every has anyone seen this film? It's the Santa show. Sorry, not film. We're not talking films. Films don't get cancelled. Uh, Santa clearly. That girl diet. says hello. <laughs> Santa clearly to diet. Hands up. Yes. No. Yeah. I heard, ben, I heard about it. Been on your top ten. Ben, really it, on your top ten. It was. It was. Good. You know what? I, it didn't make my top ten because I didn't realise it was cancelled. Dude, no. that's the problem I had. <laughs> that was the heartache yeah. I had with it. Okay. That's the thing. I'll get into it. Let me explain what Santa Clarita Diet is. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's starring Drew Barrymore, Drew, Bar- Drew Barrymore and uh, Tim- T- Timothy Oliphant. Uh, again, I have a massive crush on uh, Timothy Oliphant. So, well learned. Well learned. And he's, a- a- and he's also in Deadwood, isn't he, Neil, you little cocksucker? Um, <laughs> the, and it's about um, uh, Drew Barrymore's character, Sheila, uh, the real estate agent's. And uh, she becomes a uh, zombie, essentially. And nice. it is them just uh, dealing with her being a zombie in this comedic real life sort of scenarios of a married couple dealing with the ramifications of that and all the scenarios they get into and the daughter and the daughter's boy- boyfriend slash friend that becomes a boyfriend. Uh, it's, just, it's just fucking it's such a funny show. The st- scenarios to get into it the little ball with legs um it's it's honestly it was one of my favorite shows of all time uh from a com- like comedy shows of all time and it got cancelled and i like ben i didn't even fucking realize it was cancelled because there was nothing it just they just cut that didn't say anything i so I, i've only found out by a few years ago, googling when's the next season of Santa Clarita Diet coming out because I was having like withdrawal symptoms. I wanted, to, you know, I was I needed to see that cliffhanger because it ended on a massive cliffhanger as well. And then it's like, oh, it's been cancelled. Could you just imagine the heartbreak I went through that? Day? Yes, yes, I can. That, I mean, it was three, crushing. three seasons from 2017 to 2020, so it probably just suffered the same fate of many shows with uh, COVID. If, you know, Jose, that's probably accurate. But can you like, just Does imagine it my heartache, Jose? It doesn't I, make me feel better. No, it I needs mean, to I come think, back. I wouldn't be surprised if if the the actor salaries were came into play too, because it's Drew Barrymore and Timothy Elephant. They're very big names, and uh, it's hard to keep up with a show. Think, yeah, yeah, Netflix, a lot more. In yeah, and Netflix are fucking struggling for a few quid, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, actually, they are broke, so. 
technically. Are they? Yeah. Oh. yeah. This week? No, like... They, They're I, broke like how big football teams keep spending millions each year and then going, oh, yeah, we haven't got a payback yet. Oh, oh it's gotcha, such a gotcha. funny show, man. Like, she'd just casually kill someone and start eating them, and he'd have to, like... He was the best husband. Like, I'd love he him was, to be my he? husband. He, just, <laughs> he, like, was, he was so dedicated husband. to her as well. And it was like... You know, what's funny about it is that like, marriage is on the rocks when she dies... And it's like how they could become closer as he's like having to like pick up after her, like <laughs> you know, like you know, eating people. It's fucking excellent. It's like and the the kid, the, the boy next door kid, like he's fucking great. Like so honestly, uh, I, I it's like it's cross between like <clears throat> it's like the Burbs kind of like you know um, oh, yeah oh, the, that's the, the Tom Hanks movie right. The, it's like yeah. the Burbs <clears throat> crossed with like. God, I don't even know what to cross it with. What's that fucking um a zombie? Me, like, yeah, zombie. Any, 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 zombie. Any, That's why I never watched Santa Clara. Why zombie? Yeah, yeah. Because I zombie was out at the same time. It was either one yeah. or the other a zombie show. That, that lasted a couple seasons, right? Because I liked it and I watched yeah, the first yeah, yeah. two. Yeah, you yeah. You should just check it out, Marie. Even if <laughs> just check it out. Honestly, everyone, every just single for, one of you. Just for it. Timothy it's Oliphant's so, hair. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, here is a show that I think. David and Marie, I don't think we'll know because of their age, and the <laughs> other three Ages. of us will know. And that show, our number four, surprisingly high on the list because it was high on mine and Jose's lists. And that is a show from Fox from 1995 called Space Above and Beyond. Terrible title. I wouldn't say that. It's a terrible title. It's Jose. a very 90s title. Very 90s title. Oh, so this is a sci fi action show that opens with, of all people, Jim from Neighbours, Alan Dale, and then he gets horribly murdered, uh, giving a speech so, on the planet. So, so for the it, record, he's the dad of Penny from Lost, not oh, Penny's yeah. boat. Yes, he's also most known in the UK because he's he was Jim in Neighbours, which is like oh. an Aussie sitcom that is on every day for about the last thirty years. See, that part I didn't and... know. Jim Robinson from Neighbours is he pops up all over the place, isn't he's he? Twenty four. He's in America, uh, Captain America: Winter Soldier. Yeah, like he's like oh, yeah, so he's, he's, fucking, he's everywhere. He's he's, yeah. he's been loads of stuff, man. But so yeah. this show was created by Glenn Morgan and James Wong, who had previously worked on the X Files, and they would go on to birth the Final Destination films as well. So this show is a big sci-fi action show, and it's set in the year 2063, 64, and it starts with many of Earth's colonies and Earth itself being attacked by a race of aliens called the Chigs. Outgunned and losing badly, the bulk of the show featured on the Wildcards crew of a Space Cavalry Division. So think, you know, like Space Marines. Now, the show's lead actress was Christine Cloak, who played Captain Shane Vanson. And you might remember she was in the X-Files a little bit. Uh, she's also married to Glenn Morgan as well in real life. I'd like to say it was more of an ensemble. At the time, she wasn't that big. Uh, she also did go on to be a character in Final Destination that died. Yeah, because uh, uh, her husband is the guy, is one of those guys. I don't actually yes. know which one it is. But um, there wasn't that many other big names, even looking back at the cast list now. The only people I remembered who have gone on like, since was James Morrison, who, again, was in a lot of X-Files and Chris Carter mm-hmm. stuff, and uh, Tucker Smallwood, who I think turned up in Smallville and other, yeah. quite a lot of like those shows of the thing. So there was lots of space dog fights. There was humanity on the verge of extinction. They even brought in a third-party AI to fight these kind of, like, human-looking robots here called silicates that have been chased off Earth in the AI wars. This is 95, and they're going on about the AI wars, man. Androids, Um, again. But looking back on it now, this show is very military-based and really gritty for the time. So how can this have not been a major influence on the reboot of Battlestar Galactica? Because this is in all but name Battlestar Galactica in, in, um, in terms of and this was a decade before the reboot happened. Just I rewatched a bit of the, I like, watched some of the old promos and rewatched a bit of the first episode because it's all online the other day. And I was like, this is such a like touch point for Battlestar, man. You wouldn't have had Battlestar, I don't think, if this hadn't been around. And no one talks about it because it only ran for one season. And also, they, as you mentioned, Jose, when we were talking off camera, um, off pod a little while back, they knew it was getting cancelled. So they just decided to kill almost every character in the finale. Yeah. Just go out in a oh. blaze of glory and just like murder everyone. It was such a gut wrenching finale, but they they did it so well. Like, I was like, no, but awesome. Like, the way they died was like guns blazing, literally. 
it was it was a good it was a good ending it was sad to see it go but i guess since they knew they just decided fuck it you know let's just go out you know and it, it was just a really good show they they had a lot of land action too like they didn't stay everything in space and just the sets of the planes like the dock was really cool honestly uh right so this brings us up to our number three and this is because of me and ben and that show is <laughs> studio 60 on the sunset strip so yeah. this is from the creator of the west wing and starring the late great matthew perry in his first tv role since friends this was sorkin's attempt at portraying the behind the scenes of a fictional late night entertainment sketch show based very strongly on saturday night live Perry starred as Matt Albee, a former addict who's the head writer of the show and still a bit of a loose cannon and a risk. And his best friend slash producer is Danny Tripp, played by Bradley Whitford from The West Wing as well. Now, on paper, this show should have been great, but it had one issue that many early reviews picked up on, and I kind of agree with, is that the sketch comedy parts of the show weren't actually very funny. And yeah. if you're writing a show about sketch comedy, the comedy actually needs to be funny. The drama going around like the TV station in the show... That was brilliant. That was pure Sorkin-esque, which you expected. Um, all the material involving Matt and Danny struggling with their personal issues, the network, the cast members and each other. That was great. And look, mm. generally, I love Sorkin's work, man. The West Wing is rightfully held up as one of the best shows of all time. I even saw Newsroom. Uh, was it the News? Yeah, Newsroom was brilliant as Newsroom. well. Newsroom. Newsroom was superb. That had three seasons. Again, that was sadly cancelled before its time. I even managed to watch Sports Night back in the day, which, again, not, I think, I, I don't even know how I acquired that back in the day. And that was really good. As much as I like Studio 60, though, I can see why it got cancelled. Because for me, the tone was all over the place. Sometimes you get a bit too political. But hey, that's what you get with Sorkin. And also, it felt a bit too preachy sometimes. But it's a perfect example of a show that had it been given a second season, I'm sure it would have found its feet in an audience. And who knows where the show could have gone. Uh, the other issue for this as well, at the same time it came out on NBC, the home of Saturday Night Live, former Saturday Night Live head writer, Tina Fey, comes out with her sitcom, 30 Rock which was based on the same behind the scenes of a late night Saturday night live style show. And of course, getting the former head writer of Saturday night Live to do this, it's going to feel a lot more authentic and also be a lot more funny. And sadly for studio 60, 30 rock was much funnier and also only 22 minutes an episode and not about a full hour like studio 60 was, but studio 16, Ben, what could have been? I mean, like it had, it had legs. But it like not only was was Matthew Perry riding high on like the, the like coming out of the back end of of Friends and the movies he did with Bruce Willis like the whole oh, nine yards I think it was he like it like the the ensemble cast was was phenomenal I mean is it Bradley Whitford like who like you know you don't know his name but you've seen him in so many different things. Like he, that their friendship for me was the thing that drove this, drove the show. Oh, and honestly, 100%. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't care that the comedy wasn't funny in the sketches because it for me it wasn't about the sketches. It was just no. about like, it, that was just like that was like dressing, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was it was about what was going on behind the scenes, and I think that was lost. And I think the the fact that people wanted this because I mean, uh, there's no way they didn't know that Thirty Rock was being made. There's absolutely no way. So they want they wanted to make a different animal entirely. And people, the, the people watching it just were like, well, you have to, this, this bit needs to be better and that bit needs to be better, but missing the point of the whole show, which was, you know, friendship under pressure. And like, and how do you, how do you work in a cutthroat industry like, like TV and still maintain any semblance of normality? I, I just think it was, it was brilliantly done. And I completely agree. Had it found, had it had a second season, they would have like screwed down on the parts that worked. And it would have been glorious. They would have got some comedy writers in, maybe to write the, the comedy stuff. But you know, what do you what do you do when when your budget's pulled? Fucking nothing. Anyone else uh, watch Studio Sixty or aware of the show? No, no. Very I was a show. Thirty Rock fan. You could be both, yeah. Jose. You can be both. <laughs> Not either. Either one. Such an American tone of no. take, take on that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, is that what he has to say, Jose? <laughs> This brings us to our number two. That was stitched together fine. I think this appeared on a, quite a few of our lists, which is why it is obviously is number two. Really? And that show is Glow. Yes, Netflix's gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling show, which ran for se three seasons and was promised a fourth and final season. And then COVID happened and Netflix decided to renege on their deal and we never got a conclusion to the story. And I think that's what annoyed fans more is the way they took away the promise of an ending to the story. But firstly, what is Glow? Well, in the 80s, there was an actual gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling show, and many of the performances were actresses and models rather than sportswomen. 
Liz Flahave and Carly Mensch had seen the 2012 documentary about the original 80s glow, and that sparked their idea for the show. The central conceit of the show and the main two stars of the show were Alison Bree's Zoya the Destroyer, an even Russian-style Russian heel, the bad guy in wrestling terms, and Betty Gilpin's all-American face, the good guy, Liberty Bell. Best friends out of the ring, in the first episode at least, until we find out that Bree's character has been having an affair with Gilpin's husband, which nicely sets a path for these two characters to progress on with. Mark Merrin is also in there as great as the promoter of the Blow, Sam Silver. It had a top 80 soundtrack with banger after banger, and of course, for me... It was about wrestling, which we all know I'm a big fan of. Uh, I'm assuming the planned season four would have seen Betty Gilpin's character get more involved in the network side of T things, because that was kind of hinted at at the end of season three. And it also looked like Ruth's character was more going to get involved in the behind the scenes of the, the booking and the planning of the show, maybe directing as well. So uh, who wants to pile drive a Netflix executive? <laughs> oh, this, sure, this show is so good. I mean, I love that they incorporated a lot of the side characters so well, like, it took a while for them to be more involved, but eventually they kind of found their way. So I think that's what I really enjoyed is that like many shows that aren't good, they don't incorporate the side characters as well. And, and so when you do that, you, you, you create a reason for the people watching to, to really want to watch more. Yeah. Well, the show did well. It built out the side characters. It went on, it gave them plots and storylines. You start with your key characters and then build out TV one Oh one good TV one Oh one. Anyway, Ben, Hello. Loved it. Uh, so I, again, I've only watched the first season and like I was all in. I don't know what happened. I got sidetracked by something else. Um, and it's one that I've, I've meant to go back to time and time again. But that first season is is like perfect television. Like it's it it's it's got action, but you don't even realize it because of the wrestling. Like it's like it's got comedy because of like the the stylings of the especially Alison Brie. You know, I mean, like a wonderful, wonderful actor. Um, and it's got like, it's got drama. Like it comes out of the gate. Like it comes out hot, and it was brilliant. Uh, yeah, I I, don't, I I can't believe that it, it. I mean, I'm lucky I get to watch two more seasons, but <laughs> it it doesn't you know it doesn't resolve. So you know, I'm just again, I'm just like fuck. Do I really want to yeah. go on that journey? It kind of has a resolution to the season. Like they kind of knew. They finished, tied up a lot of the threads of this, that series, that season for, mm. for free. But they, it, I think, that, like I mentioned, it's we were told we were getting four, and then they decided mm. not to because. Yeah, of... I would say this is one of the few shows that didn't end on a cliffhanger. That if knowing ahead of time, you're okay with the way it ends. It's like yeah, there's a you're few loose threads. There's a few season. loose yeah. threads, and they definitely do tease the following season of it, which is yeah, mm-hmm. it's, said it's like a, a bit of a letdown. But, but Marie, big fan of Glow? Yeah, I mean, it was number six on my list. Um, but I, yeah, I also really enjoyed the show and I thought it was a very underrated show. Not many people were actually like knew about it and uh, was watching it maybe also the reason for the Netflix cancellation. And also one thing it also did, it like made me want to, made me watch the original documentary after I finished season one. And it also made me fall in love in the world of women's wrestling. I thought that was just just like such a cool story and they did such a great job of adapting it. And yeah, it was one of those, like the main cast was good. The ensemble cast were good. And it also was, yeah, really, really funny. There were just uh, some really great moments there. And um, it's like, it's, I wouldn't, yeah, I I still say, yeah, there was going to be, there is room for there was a room for a final season. Yeah, I mean it, it. Like I because I did think season three would be the last one, but then they kind of teased it in the final episode, and I was just like, "Oh, we're getting more great." And then yeah, it was. <laughs> David, did you ever watch Glow? Yeah, I watched the first season. Like Ben, I don't. I'm. I'm I mean, it didn't make my list. I wasn't as big a fan of it as you guys were, but I think for me, what I liked most about the show was. The ensemble, like uh, Marie mentioned, I think the uh, the chemistry between the cast was amazing, and I think the the more heartfelt stories behind the main story was uh, was good. It just didn't. I I mean, I don't know why I didn't watch the second season. There's no real reason I didn't. It just didn't. Well, what I liked is how they kind of worked. Like you say, when I worked in the summer, like I didn't realize um, Kate Nash is like a famous pop singer. I, really? I just thought she, I didn't know she. I never heard of her though. And then she was like in the show. And I was like, oh, she's just this British actress. No, I didn't know either. Yeah, she's like really well known uh, pop singer. 
And then, um, who was the other character? Apparently not Kia that Steve- well known. Well, ish. You know, mate, you're in the industry. Uh, and then Kia Stevens, who played uh, Tammy Dawson. She's actually, she's the only, like, proper pro wrestler woman in it. And she was on the verge of retirement in her actual career because just, like, injuries and because, like, the size she was, the bumps she'd taken over the years and, like, the wear and tear. But they kind of think, I think they got her on as, like, a consultant. And then she basically made a comeback out of it. Got a, like, she, I think she turned up in, like, the Women's Royal Rumble at, like, wow. WWE one year because of on the back of the show. And, like, there was a few little tie-ins they did with the show, but it never really kind of got to that stage, sadly, because I don't think the show was, like you say, promoted or was big enough, sadly. For, for me, like, the last, the last like, five years or so, there's been, like, a, just a bunch of wrestling, like, stuff with, like, Zac Efron's... Um, um... Again, that was just a year ago. It was just, yeah. it was a year ago. So like, yeah. was it? So so in that case, is this is is Glow then maybe the inspiration for this maybe. stuff like kicking off? Full run. That's I mean, interesting. I mean, on Netflix right now, the one of the number one, I think it's like the number three show is the documentary about Vince McMahon who used to own WWE and then was exposed oh, right. as a massive sex pest and not very yeah. nice person. I saw and, the first um, episode of that. It's pretty good. I think the thing I've is, seen it on TV. You, yeah, I think the thing is, if you don't know anything about wrestling or Vince McMahon you'll be shocked by this documentary. If you've been a fan, you know, there's nothing new in it. Or at least there's not wow. nothing new I've seen so far. But um, yeah, um, I, I think I think like WWE is going to Netflix in January. Uh, so it's going to be massive. Oh, wow. It's going to be bigger than you ever think it's going to be before now. You know, so oh. if you think it's big now, it's going to get even bigger when everyone with an X-Fit account can watch it. There'll be no pay-per-views anymore. There'll be, it's just all going to be on there, all their content. I wouldn't be surprised if they have their own button on the side. Of have the they bloody... gotten rid of the WWE like the whole streaming service then because they had their oh, own that's service fun. yeah yeah they did that. yeah that's gonna be going as well okay well why not when netflix are paying you like seven billion or something crazy like that for five years oh man wow. this is gonna suck me back in oh, it's just gonna be there oh, on the homepage, so david it's been a long journey and we're finally at the conclusion and there's not really any surprises there if you've heard this talk on other episodes the only surprise will be that one of the people on the podcast isn't a fan of the show that's made our number one. Who is and it? Be the... No, no, no. We can't name and shame yet, Jose. We can't name and shame yet. <laughs> yet. Yeah. Yet. So what more can be said for our number one show? Yes, that show is Joss Whedon's, before we become problematic, Firefly. A sci-fi action, Western comedy, space drama, everything, all the words. It's almost the default answer to a generation of people when we ask... What show was cancelled too soon? And the correct answer for that generation of people is always Firefly. Coming off the one-two punch of Buffy and Angel, Firefly was Whedon's first run at a sci-fi show. The problem was, it was on Fox. And famously, Fox didn't like the extended pilot episode that, you know, introduces all the characters and sets out what the show is. Instead, choosing to start with the second episode, The Train Job, because they felt it was a bit faster-paced and more action-y than the pilot. Of course, if you were watching the show when it first aired, you wouldn't have had a clue what the hell was going on either. At its core, Firefly was a sci-fi action comedy drama that followed Nathan Fillion's Captain Mel Reynolds, who was on the losing side of an intergalactic civil war, his side being the browncoats, and his crew on his ship, the Serenity. His crew consisted of wartime friend Gina Torres from Angel, as Zoe, his second-in-command, who was married to Watch, and in two dicks, comic relief pilot, Morena Baccarin is Inara, a companion, so basically space floozy, who rents a shuttle and works from there with her clients, and has a strong will they won't they vibe with Mel. Adam Baldwin was Jane Cobb, a mercenary and the muscle who absolutely would turn on you and betray you for the right price. Jules State was Kaylee, the ship's mechanic, known for a sunny outlook and also massive crush on Sean Mars, Dr. Simon Tan, a passenger they pick up in the pilot. Plus, you always need a doctor on a spaceship. And in the pilot, we find that Simon has smuggled his sister River, played by Summer Glau, onto the ship who he'd freed from an alliance, the bad guys, Black Sight, where she'd been, on, where she'd been experimented on giving her powers. Finally, we had Ron Glass as Shepherd Book, a religious man who had definitely had who definitely had an unexplained backstory that sadly never got revealed. Although there was a comic called The Shepherd's Tale that filled in his backstory, if you want to know. Now, the show was the crew of Serenity basically getting into scrape after scrape, sometimes not even having enough money to buy fuel to get to the next planet, and it was frequently and always hilarious. We loved these characters because the show took its time nicely spinning out the larger arcs. But luckily, we did get resolved in the film Serenity, like where the Reavers come from and what all the experiments from River are about. 
But at the end of the day, we were lucky we could get an end to the story in Serenity. But it's always been a case of Firefly of what could have been an epic, long-running show. Instead, we only got 14 episodes. Yes, 14, and only 12 have even fucking aired. Like, the first time most of us in the UK saw the end of Firefly was when we bought the DVD, which made them a shit ton of money and actually got the film made because of the DVD sales. So there is still a place for physical media. Yes, streamers, there is. And yes, there is a place in the special hell for the Fox execs who cancelled Firefly. The special hell. <laughs> Jose, this was your number one, as it was mine. Yo, what do you want to say about Firefly, man? I mean, if you, if you look at my my top ten, it's it's a combination of everything that I enjoyed. Uh, sci-fi with, uh, you know, different shows, uh, space, uh, cowboys. You know, it really combined them all well. But really what it came down to was Nathan Fillion and all his supporting cast. Everything. They were all so well acted and they really gelled very well together. But Nathan Fillion was like the lead that really made it happen. Ben. I mean, there's two. There's not enough time. We need to do an entire episode (laughs) on this season. Not only was this show canceled, it was canceled halfway through a season. Like 14 oh. episodes. So it was like, it was cancelled halfway through a season. Like that is criminal in itself. The things that I love about this show are um, like Inara's, in um, like, uh, is it, I can never say her name right, Marina Bakker. Yeah, guys. Thank you. Is, is it, it just Bakker? All right, that's easy. Marina Bakker. Deadpool's girlfriend. Uh, Deadpool's girlfriend. Um, her, like, the twist, one of the little twists that I loved was, they are a crew of smugglers and she rents a shuttle that attaches to this ship. And she is actually the only, she plays a prostitute, but that is the only legitimate work. So you like it, it, like prostitution is legal. And when they come to a planet, she's got loads of like legitimate work lined up. She goes off to be a prostitute and it's like, it's actually like it's done really well. And they then go along and they're like, they're the smugglers. They're like doing the dirt, like the, the, the deals that are like getting them the money for the fuel or, you know, stuff. But they, you know, they're a crew with a conscience as well. Like you, you, you think uh, one episode that they're smuggling gold and then it turns out when they actually go to sell it, it's food. Uh, like, cause it's wrapped in like, go, go, look, make, wrapped up to look like gold was that bricks. Medicine was that medicine? There's a medicine one, wasn't it? Not food. Uh, no, there's, is it the medicine? I don't know. No, it's, they, they, because they say that they're bricks in that episode, oh, okay. and they're stamp, stamped alliance bricks. And then, like, she, he, like, they go to that planet where there's, they're going to be, um, uh, they, there's a trap waiting for them, and Jane's yeah, got yeah. like his fucking like, sniper rifle, and the the woman that he's selling them to opens one up and eats one, and it's like, oh yeah, that's they're good bricks, you know, like so, like, so, like they're they're a crew of the conscience, and I remember like the um the the inspiration behind it when interviewed, um it was it was like what happens when you think about like a, a crew in space where you think about like the millennium falcon so imagine like a, a bunch of like smugglers on the millennium falcon like just ro- roaming through space just trying yeah. to make ends meet if a star wars show was literally just following around the millennium falcon on the smuggling runs that was yeah. kind of the idea was wasn't it and, and it was clever because they had like the when you get to the what they call the edge of space they had the reavers which were these like inhuman humanoids that would like space cut cannibals their, like, te- Space cannibals that would cut their own flesh up and like destroy like ships, so they they barely worked, and they all had like radiation poisoning, and they would like tear apart. And like in the in the in the season, like you never saw them, but just the way that people talked about them and the way it was yeah. acted around these reavers, you were scared of them as what like watching the show. Like um, genius. Jane, Jane, the big tough mercenary guy. It's the only time he looks scared in the whole series is when they mention the reavers, and you're like, oh yeah, shit, but- if he's scared. Yeah, he wants to. He wants to fight anybody, but like, if he runs and like he turns and runs and fucking, you know, you know, it's big, a big bad. But like having like there was clearly a story for them, and the, and the movie like like gives you a, what is like fucking fantastic backstory on the Reavers, yeah. genius level, like you know. So yeah, like everything comes together to to create like the ensemble cast that the cast are fucking phenomenal and they've all gone on to do like like really, really great stuff but they are all incredible in this they you know the the story was clearly planned out way beyond the first season as you, you know because there's like yeah. comics and you know the movie and stuff so you know it was really well thought out and it was a lot of love i think a lot of like 
a lot of like a genuine like care put into this show that you know mixed perfectly space with a western because the further out in space from the central planets you get the more people like have a little bit of technology yeah you have a little bit of technology but they're like terraforming planets so they look like the wild west because they're just becoming planets so it was just really really well put but it was a thinking person's sci-fi show you know but it was also really funny it was so funny in every episode i mean there's a but bit I mean, where when he, um... when he when he kicks that kicks that Kicks that guy into the fucking jet engine, jet engine and, yeah. and moves on to the next one. Yeah. Oh, it's right. just, Are you going to tell me what you want to know? There's a bit where um, James trying to shoot someone. He's been drugged and he shoots a guy in like the arm or something. And he goes, I'm, and he goes, Oh, good shot. He goes, what do you mean? I missed. I was aiming for his head. It's like things like that. You know, when mm. Mal accidentally doesn't realize a local custom, he ends up getting married. Yeah. <laughs> and like yeah. the priest character just keeps going. You don't take advantage of that girl. You're going to go to the special hell. And then he just pops his head back around the corner. He's like, the special hell. And like, it was just the human. It was so good. And um, there's so many big actors as well. That was um, oh, the girl from Mad Men. Before she became famous from Mad Men, she was in that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Christina yeah. Hendricks. That was it. Oh, but, um, yeah. yeah. Right. Now for a bit of counterpoint. Someone who didn't love Firefly with all their heart. Ooh. Marie. Yeah, this wasn't on my list at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I... Someone get the airlock. <laughs> I never gelled with the series. I I did like the movie a lot better than I did like the series, but I don't think I even ever finished the series. I I do not know. Like I like I did the whole like I watched Buffy, I watched Angel, and then I thought, okay, the next step was to watch Firefly. And maybe because the legacy of it was just too big, mm. it just did not live up to my expectations found it kind of boring and (laughs) (laughs) um yeah it's just didn't click i I liked i did like the ideas of the concepts and maybe that's why i enjoyed uh enjoyed the movie more i did like the the whole idea behind the reverse and the whole conclusion that led to that was really good and um i really like that story but the rest, yeah, um, it it wasn't for me. Maybe I I'll give it another go as an adult adult uh, because like as a teenager it didn't click at all. Um, but yeah. How far did you get into it? I think I did see like seven episodes. Okay, okay, so, um, that's a good way. Like I mean, I, I give something a very long time before I mm. I move on. I mean, uh, Firefly was two thousand and two. That's a very so I, I just wonder, like, um, friend of the pod, uh, Stu, does a Stu World Order podcast. He does retro Buffy reviews, having watched it and really enjoyed it when he, I think he watched it and really, no, his wife watched it and really enjoyed it when it was first on. He never watched it, so he's re-watching it with his wife, and his reviews are hilarious, because what looking at Buffy through a modern lens, it's so oh. problematic in a lot of ways. So I just mm. hope that Firefly isn't the same way, but knowing what Josh Sweden is like now, it's kind of... I almost don't want to go back and have it sullied by overanalyzing it too much. I've what? rewatched it recently. I've, I've, okay. I rewatched. I rewatched Firefly consistently. There's there's no problems and I, that I can see with it. Like there's no. I mean they like they they skirt like like um like like sort of like racial harmony is probably the wrong word, but like where they use the two biggest superpowers in the world when they, when it sort of like fell apart would have been America and China. So they've man- mashed those two yeah, languages yeah. together. To, the Chinese so, insults. So the, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's like there's like Chinese there's like Chinese like swear words and stuff in there and insults. <laughs> but there's also like some, so they describe stuff. And if you look at all the signs in the background, there's a mix of like um, uh, like Chinese and like Western like language. Yeah. There was that well, big melding of the two, wasn't there, for the future for yeah. the production design of the show? And also they said swearing in Chinese meant they could get it past the census. Yeah. Yeah, but it was, it was it was really clever, and I, you know, I mean, like there was, um, like, there's a lot of stuff in that show that it, I don't know, it it was it was safe whilst also like exploring things that you want to explore. Like, what's it like to be a, a smuggler when, when you're on the wrong side of the law, but you are on the wrong side of the law for moral reasons. Like that was the part of it that like was really interesting to me. There was a strong moral code on that on, on that ship, whereas like it's like again, it's the, the Star Wars comparison is there because there's like the the rebels, they're the rebellion. Technically, when you look at the news now, 
the rebels are the bad guys and you know the governments would be the empire so you know like the the alliance which was the empire were the bad guys from their point of view but the alliance are just trying to like terraform planets and make everybody live under their rules so they can have like civilization so yeah like i really love that that kind of uh the exploration that you like it, morally are you if you're driven morally are you more right than you know like a, a bigger overarching government nice, I'm more, i mean i'm punk rock i'm always gonna say yes <laughs> uh david you have not chipped in on this one yeah uh well t- t- to be honest i watched it when i was about 15 maybe maybe 15 2002 it came out so yeah i, I mean i'm 32 now so it was a while back i can't really remember all that much of it i just remember the chemistry between the the crew being amazing and i remember being invested in the world that was created within like three episodes and that's pretty much it that's all i i can remember i can remember it being what like it's like it's like heroes for me it was like the potential of being one of the greatest shows ever if it wasn't so mismanaged uh it's the, it's a potential for me that's i mean like we say showing figure. it out of order and i i think the problem is i do think and i can kind of take marie's point on like the pilot episode is a little slow to get going because it has to introduce all the characters and set them up and so i can see i can i'm not not that i'm ever defending a fox exec but if you look at the <laughs> train job which is the second episode and it's just boom straight into action bar fights spaceships uh cattle literal actual cattle they were transporting in that one which is like the twist at the end when you get to the end of the uh the the, the um the cargo bay and you imagine this treasure and it's actual cows that was brilliant. I would just like to say one thing in terms of like how the show holds up. I I I'm kind of a fan of YouTube where I watch people reacting to movies and TV shows. It's kind of like an easy thing while I work. And uh one of the most popular series I think is Firefly. They'll watch the series and then they'll cap it with watching the movie. And that's that's like something that has happened even more recently, I think with new people getting back into that show because there's some young viewers out there who didn't really know anything about it. And I think that's it's it's one of those things where you see their reactions and they they make it through and they have a very positive experience. I wouldn't say they agree with some of us who watched it as it came out, but I feel like they usually tend to enjoy the, sh- the show and the movie. And then obviously some characters, uh, you know, don't make it all the way through and then they are sad when they they pass away. So I, I feel like it may not be as as like you said, it has a lot to live up to, but I feel like if you just go and go into it as a show that you wanted to enjoy, I think it's possible to do that. Oh, he's gone. Oh, excellent. Right. We're in charge, team. What are we, <laughs> what are we, what are we get away with? <laughs> <laughs> we can say oh, anything we want. He won't I interrupt wanna, us. Amazing. I want to mention one show that I had on my list as number 10, but he didn't put it in the notes. Uh, <laughs> Tell us, Jose, quick, what is it? You, don't let him be quick, quick, you. Don't let Neil it, censor you. It's the show I am not okay with this. It uh, it was on Netflix for one season. Cancelled. It's over, Jose. No, cut. Cut. You cannot put something in after one. Well, perfect timing there. And I'd like to thank my co-host for joining here today. I'd like to thank Marie. Oh, oh we're ending abruptly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank David. Thank you, my man. I'd like to thank Ben. Read it out. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Just hold it a little uh, bit lower. Like a... And yeah. And I'd like to thank Jose. I am not okay with this star Sophia Lewis as Sydney Novak. No. And don't forget, if you enjoyed what you've seen today, you can see this or you've been watching it on YouTube. It's been a long pod and that didn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, golf clap. Golf clap for everyone. Well done, everyone. Well done, everyone. David stayed awake for about 90% oh, of it. Oh my Jose... God, you have no idea how challenging that was. Jose didn't eat anything. I don't I mean, there's think no reflection on the he content. Did. He did. I saw him eat something. He definitely Multiple ate something. Things. Multiple things. Yep. And, I drank uh, three yeah. different drinks as well. Every now and then you just see Was the one of them your own urine? Jose's mouth. I beg your Would pardon. You? 
I beg your pardon. Two right. very different comments right there. And don't forget, if you like the podcast, give us a like and subscribe, like the kids say, on YouTube, where you have been watching this episode. And of course, we are still available on all audio platforms, on your podcast platforms of choice. We're on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're generally everywhere. You can't escape us. And also, since then, we have been nominated for an, an award at the Independent Podcast Awards. For golf clap for Ben, no, big clap for Ben, and for our friend Phil, who isn't here, but has never been on the podcast, for doing our theme music. Yes, we have been nominated for Best Theme Song at the Independent Podcast Awards. And hopefully by the time this comes out, or maybe very shortly afterwards, we'll know whether we won or not. Will we have to make speeches? Will we have to go on stage? Will anyone else bar me actually be there at the minute? No. no. I definitely won't. I'm going to I'm gonna record my acceptance speech uh, and send it to you so they have to play it on that big video I, screen. I can also Brilliant. do that. If you, if, yeah. No, David, because you're in a country and you don't excuse. You're in Norwich. <laughs> Also, home. also, what? Also, out of the two of us, only one of us actually wrote it. So I know, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll accept it on your behalf. It's fine. It's great to be. I'm going to great to be here. Sorry, Ben can't be. He's LA. He's in LA on his way to Australia, wrangling rock stars. It's all written. It's all good to go, man. Love it. And that's all the time we have today on this episode of We Need Roads podcast. We'll see you next time, folks. We needed roads. <laughs>